The meeting of the Transportation and Public Safety Committee of Brooklyn Community Board 2 is called to order and is being recorded on the CB2 YouTube archive in accordance with the NYC Open Meetings Law. It is the practice of Community Board 2 to conduct remote meetings with all committee members' cameras on, please, if you have that capability. And if you're calling in from the phone, we understand. Um, we encourage all public attendees to also leave their cameras on, particularly if you are given the floor to speak. All attendees, please keep your microphone muted when you're not speaking. To maintain appropriate discussion and voting process, I will make it known when and which topics are open for comment by committee members, board members at large, and the general public. If you have questions that fall outside of the public comment time, please type your questions in the chat panel and we'll address them if uh, time permits. You may also contact the district office. Um, you can use the email on the website. We are committed to providing access for all of our neighbors, regardless of physical ability or limitation. So if you require accommodation or assistance for full participation, please contact the district office 72 hours prior to any public meeting. We will now begin the roll call. And our secretary, John Quint, will do the roll call. Uh, chairperson. Julia Cohen Chung. Present. Uh, Vice Chair Cheryl Geld. Secretary John Quinn. Present. Ernest Augustus. John Duke. John Duke. No, you're there. Say hello. I'm present. Yes, yes. Thank you. Dora Gallo. Howell. Ed Meyer. Present. Here. Here. Christine Todd. Uh, Caroline, I'm here. Caroline, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm looking at last name. Caroline, you're here. here. Okay. Did you say Sandy Balboza? No, I didn't. Sandy Balboza. Okay. And we have a new committee member that's an old committee member, Ciro Scala, that we'd like to welcome. Thank you very much. I'm happy to be here. Same old faces, but I hope we have a lot of new things to discuss. Welcome back, Ciro. Thank you. And if any, well, I guess I'll see if anybody comes on. Did I miss, are there any members whose name I called who are now have been unmuted and want to Say their presence. Oh, shit. Cheryl's Cheryl. on, John. Cheryl. Cheryl. Okay, Cheryl. Hi, uh, John. Okay, so we have, um, we're just missing Ernie, Doreen, and Brian. Everybody else is here. Okay, great. Thanks. Um, so prior to the approval of the agenda, I just wanted to make one modification. Um, I'll share the screen so people can see the agenda. Oh, um, Kaya, could you let me share the screen? Um, Kaya, I can't share the screen. Oh, got it. Thank you. Yeah. So um, after the 11 points presentation and then after our um, discussion with policy advocate Brian Brandon Holmes. I've invited uh, Brandon Smith from the um, uh, the Health and Human Services Committee to speak to us about community courts in light of our uh, discussion of the statement of district needs and budget priorities. So, um, if I could get an approval of that amended agenda. Agreed. I move. Seconded. Great, thank you. Um, you can stop the screen share, Taya. Thank you. And then now we will move to um, the presentation of Eleven Hoyt and Kate Sella from Bjork Ingalls Group will be presenting. Yes, along with Regina. And would you guys like to all introduce yourselves? Sure. I'm Kate Sella. I'm a senior landscape architect at BRK Ingalls Group. 
I'm Regina Meyer uh, at the Downtown Brooklyn Partnership. Welcome. Thank you. I'm very happy to be here. Can you all see my screen? Yeah. Okay, great. So tonight, um, I'm going to start off and then hand it off to Kate. Um, I know that um, you all are really familiar with downtown Brooklyn, so we're going to keep this very quick. Um, but I'd say, um, why don't you go to the next slide, um, Kate? Um, I, I, you know, we had the pleasure of introducing the idea that downtown Brooklyn partnership was working on a new vision for the core of downtown Brooklyn over the winter. And we spent a lot of time talking to you about our goals. Um, the good news from that is that we had the opportunity to continue our work with um, the consultants over the past, um, I'd say, um, winter and spring and now in, into um, summer. And we focused on some key areas of the core of downtown where we knew that there were, were changes afoot and felt that um, we could um, really study them and understand them um, and perhaps um, recommend changes to really improve the pedestrian um, experience. And I have to say, in light of the health crisis, the idea of adding more sidewalk space and improving our sidewalk space has become more of an imperative for everyone in New York City as we realize how important it is to social distance and to walk places and bicycle places in lieu of um, taking transit at this time when everyone is so concerned. Um, the goals of, of the um, study I'll go through very quickly and, and this effort, um, you'll remember this from the winter time, were to are to improve the streetscape, establish a stronger sense of place and strengthen identity. And we were especially focusing on those areas of downtown Brooklyn that haven't seen any improvement literally in over 50 years. And if you go to the next slide, Kate, um, the ideas were to make downtown Brooklyn safer and greener and more walkable and, and use color um, when it was possible to really distinguish our neighborhood. And the next slide um, um, shows ways we are doing that um, through changes in street geometry, which is what you'll hear about today when Kate describes um, the project, greening, um, new street furniture, color, and um, different materials um, as a part of the sidewalks. And the idea for the next, the next slide, Kate, is that where we're handing it over to you? Um, um, I, I just, before I, I do turn it over to Kate, I, I would say that we're very grateful to the partnership with DOT um, because you'll see that we were able to fast track a project at 11 Hoyt, which is under construction to vastly improve the sidewalk space on Hoyt and Elm Street and Livingston Street. And those streets really have not been improved um, ever. The sidewalk widths, especially on Hoyt and Elm, are substandard at eight feet. And I'm very grateful to DOT to um, let us work through these details. So I'm going to hand it over to Kate at this point. Thank you. So everyone can hear me? Um, so, we really focused extensively on greening and 11 Hoyt presents a very unique opportunity in downtown Brooklyn because there are no subways underneath the block. So we're able to really focus um, on expanding sidewalks and providing in-ground planting, which, as Regina said, due to the sidewalk with Elm in particular, currently only has one tree on it. Um, so I'll keep going. Sorry. So, and part of our sort of downtown Brooklyn study was also looking at how to pedestrianize space, how to expand the public realm. So this is sort of the existing pedestrian network in downtown Brooklyn. And we've really looked with DOT at phasing. How can we phase and implement additional shared streets building off of what's already there on Willoughby on Lawrence and uh, Willoughby Square and as well as Alby. And this was sort of our our ultimate goal is to really pedestrianize as many of the streets as we can that don't have high traffic volumes. Um, and so this would be our phase two. So Levin Hoyt is surrounded on both sides by, uh, by Hoyt and Elm, which we're trying to make into shared streets. 
And so just so you can see the existing conditions, this is White Street. Um, and, you know, due to the ongoing construction, there is a lot of scaffolding. However, as Regina mentioned, the sidewalk was are substandard, substandard, especially considering how busy the two, three uh, subway station is. And Elm, again, this is the one existing tree you can see that's not in great health. And the rest of it, uh, the side along 11 point in particular is only eight feet wide, it's quite narrow. And Livingston, um, just due to the scaffolding, the sidewalk widths are uh, acceptable due to the scaffolding, they're quite narrow. At the moment. But what we're really here to sort of present to you and to ask of you is we're really looking at widening sidewalks to increase greening and those two things together we're kind of creating a distinctive sidewalk which i'll go into in more detail about so something that as regina meant was strengthening the identity and really trying to establish a sense of place in downtown brooklyn so this is the existing bpp um, the Builder Pavement Plan at 11 Hoyt, showing the trees that are planned. Uh, these are trees are already there along both Hoyt and Livingston. As you can see, due to the sidewalk width, there's nothing planned currently for Elm Street. So what we're proposing um, and what we've been working through at DOT is widening the sidewalks. So Elm Street in particular would go from eight foot wide to 16 feet wide. And then we could really add a substantial rain garden as well as potentially seven new trees, um, which we think would be a very big deal in downtown Brooklyn. And Hoyt Street, we'd also be increasing the planting significantly. Overall, it would be almost a 900 square foot increase in planting and 450 square feet of that would be a rain garden. So we have studied material palettes extensively. This is our preferred palette. We think it will be really durable and age well. We're using all of DOT's sort of standard materials, four inch concrete. We're just trying to add a tint to it, a color, sort of a reddish. And we're also using a standard steel face curve. Um, our other distinctive elements would be the 410 steel planting guards um, designed to not sort of lead onto the sidewalk. And we've also been looking at custom furniture as well, with 3D printed concrete furniture. So the color would be within the material in all cases. So it's not like it would chip away or scratch. So these are just views of our preferred option. Um, this is Hoyt Street looking back towards the Fulton Mall. So you can see we're really trying to establish an increase in identity with planting. And this would be Livingston Street. And this is Elm Street, where we can kind of add our most significant planting. Um, because it's currently in the building on Elm Street, there's only one entrance, which is why we can do such an amazing amount of planting. And then this is, an, we have a few alternative color palettes um, for PDC. And so to kind of look at it just being a two-tone gray concrete is another option we have. And our third option was to do an exposed aggregate within the concrete. Um, and just to kind of show you, so the idea is really to sort of expand the sidewalk, the curb line, and by expanding it, you can then fit uh, a larger planter, and you can also kind of distort the planter slightly by kind of having this indent to create a seating area that's out of the circulation path entirely. Uh, and then the gray tones just represent the different tones of concrete, and then we're sort of playing with the idea that the, scor the score lines in the pavement that are all saw cut could perhaps bend. Um, and just to give you a sense of this is the distinctive tree guards um, and how we're trying to kind of create something that's durable, long lasting, and gives a little bit of identity. And we spent a lot of time really working on the planting to sort of, uh, it's a nice situation where Hoyt is full shade and Livingston is part sun and part shade. So there's really an articulation we can have with the planting. And Elm Street can be really colorful since it's part sun, part shade, um, whereas Hoyt would be a little bit more green. And then this is just a view to summarize. So that was what we have. If you all have any questions or would like to discuss anything further, or let me know if I went too fast. Thank you, Regina. Thank you, Kate. 
Um, I, I would like to compliment the whole team on this. Um, the Downtown Brooklyn Partnership told us a couple months ago that you guys were going to bring more open space, more greenery, more greenery and more color to Downtown Brooklyn. And you guys are, are doing it. You're finding opportunities to really bring that plan to life. And it wasn't just pretty pictures you're showing us. You're, you're actually doing it. So really appreciate that um, those opportunities that you're finding. And DOT that you're open to this non-standard um, Brooklyn the Builders Pavement Plan also really really great to see this expedited approval and 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 such a cool design too. Think thanks. thanks uh, um, thank you, Julia. And I guess the only thing I'd want to say is that obviously this is just, uh, expedited because of the PDC, but we'd love to have a time uh, time in the future when you have more time to talk about the district as a whole, so we could really work together, frankly to look at ways to fund and implement over the long term, because we all know that downtown Brooklyn needs a lot of, you know, has a lot of junctures um, that would really be great to improve. So I, I really look forward to the partnership. That sounds great. Thank you, Regina. We, we do have one item on our um, budget priorities, which is new plazas, but it's not specific to location. So I think it would be great to work together to sort of um, envision that. That would be fabulous. Thanks. So I'd like to open it up for uh, comments by committee members. I, I have a question about how it's funded. How is it funded? John Du wants to go next. Um, this would be um, the sidewalk widenings um, and additional plantings will be funded um, as a part of the new sidewalks along the development. So it's a city. It's city funded. No, developer funded. Developer funded. Great. Thank you. Uh, I had a question about the. Um, it's zero scala. About the, um, the the legal size of a sidewalk. Could you just let me know what is the actual appropriate size that a normal sidewalk should be? Um, I think anything less than 12 feet in downtown Brooklyn is, especially in an area that's busy, is sort of substandard. 12 feet along with a few feet taken up by streetlights, utilities, other things. Um, so I would say anything below 12 feet is substandard. Uh, the sidewalk on Hoyt is 10 feet and the one on Elm is 8 feet. So they're they're very, very narrow for the amount so of So you're, you're increasing the size of both, of, I understand. Yeah, we're increasing I the size of both to about 16 feet. That's great. And do you one more question? Do you have plans to increase the size of other sidewalks downtown in downtown Brooklyn? Well, that's on the, on the drawing board. I mean, we would really like to, and that's what I was mentioning earlier. Um, that we don't have plans, um, exact plans, because we don't have opportunities where developers are required to build new sidewalks. But we really want to work together to identify those locations. I mean, I would say all sidewalks. Um, Probably could be saying that, but obviously every street would need to be studied and we have to work with the And Regina, is your um, plan that you presented to us last time, um, or Belinda and, and May presented to us last time, is that on your website? Um, the, the plan that's no, like the presentation, rather. The one from the winter? Yeah. I believe so, but we'll we will check. So, Sarah, you uh, before you join the rejoin the committee, um, there there was a more in depth presentation about um, uh, public space, open space, transportation, and downtown Brooklyn. Oh, great! And there there are minutes to that effect, Juliet. Um, I would go to their website and see the actual picture presentation. That would be thank you. Yeah, I do that. have to compliment them. It's a it's a it's an interesting and wonderful uh, presentation. Very pleasing. So I wanted to recognize John Du who spoke, and then after that, John Quince, please. Yes, uh, Regina, I haven't seen you in a minute. Good to see you. Oh, I, to see you John. I want to reference the diminished traffic at Hoyt and Flatbush, and that particular intersection is unsignaled mm -hmm. and generally problematic in terms of crossing and the traffic that chooses to turn on to Hoyt Street, is that being addressed at all? Hoyt and Flatbush? 
Yes. Hoyton Fulton here. Fulton, I'm sorry. Okay. Um, I, um, I don't believe so. Um, DOT, did Emily or Neil? I'm sorry, what was the question? The question is the intersection of Hoyt and I said Flatbush is Fulton Street. Uh, that's an unsignaled crosswalk area where when cars choose to turn onto Hoyt Street, there is constantly a con uh, conflict with pedestrians and cars choosing to enter Hoyt Street. Oh, something like that, you can enter into the 311 system or you can send me an email and I'll put your request in to um, create a study to see if the intersection can be signalized either by a multi-way stop or a traffic signal. Um, and we can go from there. That, that's that been a request for many years now that DOT has not been able to come up with a solution for. So I'm pointing it out again because this is yet another opportunity to take a look at it. So Since, it has been studied and denied, correct? Oh, for years that's been uh, an intersection that remains pro problematic because it's uh, right near the exit of the Nevin Street IRT station. Folks yeah. get off Evan Street and then have to walk down and 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 cross Hoyt in order to access the Fulton Street corridor. Yeah, yeah. Well, sometimes unfortunately um, intersections, if they do not meet the federal mandates, cannot be um, signalized either by a stop um, stop sign or a traffic signal. And if we don't have those in place, unfortunately, we can't um, implement a crosswalk um, a crosswalk so, at the intersection with no stop control is more dangerous for the pedestrian than um, well you you might not be able to do anything <coughs> from a spelling perspective but possibly you could explore some treatments on the pavement that would further delineate a pedestrian crossing and alert the uh, uh, traffic to be more cautious. That's an intersection that we've asked DOT to look at again forever uh, and, and to study the accidents at that intersection. So I think that might be helpful to take a look at. I mean, all that is taken into account when studying the intersection. And unfortunately, from what I'm sort of getting is that it's been denied that they don't meet the the federal mandate that um, that would require us to install something. And if it doesn't meet that, then we cannot. Regina, do you think given 11 Hoy is a huge condo building that's just opening that maybe it could be looked at, like your scope could be expanded just a little to look at that intersection and what yeah. civilization might be recommended? I need to look at this more because a, a few different things I would respond to. One, there's not that many cars on F Fulton, if not any because it's a busway. Um, so, so the issue for, and um, I think most cars though, just to speak to your question about 11 Hoyt, actually will not be using Fulton because the access to the garage um, for um, 11 Hoyt is actually mid block. Um, so I, th I, I would just like to look into this more. Um, I don't think it's something that is developer driven clearly this um you know it i, I want to learn more about john the conflict that john is um talking about because the function of fulton street is important to all of us um oh thanks kate but what you see the, from the developers the, from the picture from 11 hoyt is that all the cars in the development are actually going to be using livingston street and going up to elm to access that garage um um, but let, let us get back to the committee on this item, um, because I certainly um, want to learn more from John about um, what he's talking about with the Nevin Street subway, because, you know, the nearest subway here is Hoyt Street. Um, and I just want to learn more about what he's got in mind. So Great. Maybe, Thanks, Regina. Maybe John um, and I can follow up separately. Is that okay? Is that okay under the rules? I, I never get. That would be great. Okay. John, you and I have to make that happen.
We Thanks. also have to catch up on your old Brooklyn Bridge Park place, Regina. Nah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And then after John Quint, Caroline Todd has something to say. John Quint? We can't hear you, John. Your microphone is off. All right, I'm going to go to Caroline and then we'll come back to you, John. Okay. Uh, hi, yeah, this looks great. And I mean, it's very much in line with the presentation we saw in the winter um, from downtown Brooklyn partnership. And it's exciting that this can happen uh, quickly. I do wonder, I mean, I, w I walked down Fulton an hour ago um, and, you know, it was bustling and uh, great. And there were so many street vendors out. And that's, you know, one of the things I really love about downtown Brooklyn and the Fulton Mall. And I wonder what this does for street vendors, both regulated and unregulated, and uh, just want to encourage that, uh, you know, commerce as uh, helpful, not hurtful. Yeah, I mean, actually, I, I would say this is silent on, on vendors, Carolyn. Obviously, we have to follow the citywide rules, but you are correct that vendors are permitted on Fulton Street. Okay, great. As long as there's, I, I guess this, it speaks more broadly to Fulton maybe, but I mean, I definitely did see vendors along uh, Elm and Hoyt around the corners. And yeah, as long as there's nothing done design wise to prohibit them, um, that's, that's, that would be something that would concern me. Um, like any kind of barricades or intentional street furniture that didn't make that accessible. Okay, John Quint. No, I, I was actually, when when you heard me, I was making a comment to Ciro about the, the uh, presentation because it had been at the board meeting, not at our committee meeting. So I, I have nothing, I have no comment. Oh, both, they came to both. Right. But but the bigger presentation was at the uh, okay that's right the board meeting. Uh, Juliet, can you hear me? Yes, Sandy. Go. John, you didn't have anything else to say? No, I did not. Okay, go ahead, Sandy. Okay, I'm having trouble because this is my first time doing this. Um, I was just wondering, Macy's is across the street, and so their sidewalk is is going to be the same as it was. It's not going to be like unified or connected to the 11 Hoyt side, right? No, but their sidewalk is wider to begin with. It's like 14 feet wide on the Macy side, but we have sort of the material palette was in many ways derived from the new pile they put on the Macy's facade. They have these beautiful sort of wavy terracotta glazed tile. And that was really the inspiration for this material palette. So we think the two will work together very well. Okay. And are you, there are three curb cuts, one on each side of the building. Is, is that correct? Hoyt, yes. Livingston, and Elm. And which is the, which is used for the garage? The, they, 11 Hoyt has an interior motor port. So, the one on the, the southern one on Elm is used for the interior port, motor port as well as the one on Hoyt. The other one on Elm, this is their loading dock entrance. And the activity, because um, I maybe I missed that, the activity of the building once it's open and the loading docks and the garages and the, you know, traffic going into the building, I, I assume for the residents. Um, it, it, did DOT study the impact or is there, is that going to come later or what? Yeah, so designs, um, construction designs are, uh, submitted to DOT for approval. Um, it has been reviewed. Uh, I, I don't know when, but I can look that up. Okay, and Hoyt Street um, is a has a lot of traffic. Um, it's um, southbound, and there's always a lot of traffic coming. I'm on I'm on Atlantic, and Hoyt. So, how does the narrowing 
does the narrowing of the street, because you're widening the sidewalk, so you're narrowing the street, how does that affect traffic? Or parking? I mean, this doesn't change the moving traffic at all. This, what this does is um, 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 eliminate parking. And who parked there? I know I've, I, you know, I pass it all the time, but who exactly parks there? Um, my bet is it's a lot of placard parking, but I'm going out of my lane here. <laughs> Well, that's a problem for us all. So if they have to move from there, they're going to come somewhere else and they need to be stopped. And I hope that the downtown partnership will work on that and not just push that off on the surrounding neighborhoods that are still close enough for them to. I mean, we have them parking on Atlantic Avenue, taking the meters all day. All right, let's stay on, on this to see if there's any more comments on 11 Hoyt, uh, maybe from um, community board members, opening it up to people who are not on the committee. You can type in the chat if you'd like to speak and you don't see anybody typing in. Um, how about members of the public? You can use the raise hand feature. Where is that? Uh, feel free to introduce yourself and speak. Zero Scala, do, oh, do you Sarah, hear me? You already, you already participated. <laughs> oh, OK. I just had one more question. It was about the fact that is the developer, do we know if the developer is allowing for a bike parking in their building, but just bicycles, not city bike, just bike parking? We don't know, but we can ask and get back to you. Would you like to advocate for that on the sidewalk? What was that? Would you like to advocate for bike parking on the sidewalk? Well, I, I think the sidewalk are fantastic, and I, I wouldn't want to add bikes there, but I think if they have a parking spot for cars, it would be good to, since the times are changing. They would have biking parking for their employees or people or the people who live in the building. Okay, thanks, Sarah. Yeah, I'm pretty sure they do have bike parking, but we'll get back to you on an exact number. Thank you. Thank you. All right, it doesn't look like anybody else is, has raised their hand to speak. It, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Carol Ann? No, oh, I don't see anyone else. Okay, then I would like to thank um, everybody for presenting today. Thank you, Regina. Thank you, Kate. Thank, thank you, you very much. You're welcome. Thank you. Okay. And um, now we'll move into um, the second part of our um, agenda. Um, is Mr. Brandon Holmes on the phone? I saw him sign in. Yes. Okay. Uh, Brandon, you're um, muted. If I see you there. Can you hear me? Yes, we hear you now. Hi, how's it going? So, uh, great. I would just like to introduce Brandon. Um, he is, uh, Mr. Holmes is a, an organizer and policy advocate in the social justice arena. He's worked with uh, numerous uh, organizations in criminal justice and police accountability. Um, and um, he can tell you um, more of the specifics about um, his background and um, what he's going to do is just give us a little bit of um, color on um, what other organizations across the city are doing in um, the realm of um, rethinking criminal justice um, and um, accountability and civil liberties. Um, and then um, after he's done, um, he will be participating in our discussion of the um, budget priorities and, and statement of district needs. And, and also Brandon Smith is here um, to discuss and teach us about the community court system as well. All right, um, I'll hand it over to um, Brandon Holmes. Thank you, appreciate it, Julia. Um, so good evening, everyone. My name is Brandon Holmes. Uh, as Julia shared, I'm an advocate uh, and community organizer. Um, in some of my former roles, I worked at Vocal New York, which is a Brooklyn based grassroots organization and harm reduction service provider where I worked with folks who were currently on parole or formerly incarcerated 
uh, in removing barriers to employment um, and also working on uh, you know, some strategies to provide treatment and harm reduction services instead of incarcerating folks who are living with substance uh, abuse disorders. Uh, then I worked at the New York Civil Liberties Union, where I developed an expertise around police accountability and transparency uh, advocacy efforts, and some uh, on the state level, uh, some work around decarceration and decriminalization, uh, and also advocating to repeal Article 50A, which until this week uh, effectively hid all law enforcement disciplinary records from the public. Um, and now uh, in my current role or, and where I will be taking a leave of absence from uh, in a couple of weeks, I've been at Just Leadership USA uh, managing and directing the campaign to close Rikers Island, um, which has effectively in the past four years seen the New York City jail population go from 11,000 to below 4,000 uh, today. We've covered below 4,000 uh, for the past several months due to a lot of COVID-19 uh, release efforts to rapidly decarcerate our jails and protect people from contracting COVID, uh, and also due to a lot of pretrial legislative reforms that were passed up in Albany. One of the things that I wanted to discuss with you all tonight, um, and I was invited by Robert Paris, uh, as you know, him, he and I have crossed paths and uh, collaborated in different community spaces before, um, and along with some of you on the call, I see Sandy, um, is on here too. Um, what I wanted to share with you all is for the past two years uh, with the Close Rikers campaign, we've developed the Build Communities platform, uh, which our team published in 2019 and 2020. And this was done in collaboration with hundreds of directly impacted community members and service providers and experts uh, across all five boroughs to identify key areas where the city could divest from the criminal legal system and begin to invest in local community-based programs and resources that improve the quality of life for all New Yorkers. And I know Brandon Smith is gonna talk about uh, his experience with the Red Hook Community Justice, uh, or the Red Hook Community Justice Court. Um, and that's you know one of the things that we definitely want to amplify and prioritize and making sure that every community uh, gets access to conflict resolution and alternative uh, to alternatives to incarceration or alternatives to detention, those types of resources. I currently live in Bed-Stuy, um, represented by Community Board 3, uh, and I'm looking forward to hearing from all of you tonight about what your priorities are and you know, what the statement of needs, some of the top issues you want to address are. Um, but I'm gonna share in the link, a uh, link to in the chat to the 2020 report that our team did. Um, definitely identifies areas of workforce development, uh, public health, conflict uh, resolution, and alternative forms of accountability. Uh, and also family planning and family support. I'm gonna share that document in here so that you can see some of the language we've used about how when we talk about public safety um, and we talk about public health, we need to address all public safety as a public health crisis, right? We need to have rehabilitative and restorative approaches uh, to public safety issues in our communities um, and recognizing that violence is also violence, uh, homelessness, drug use are also re the result of a lack of investment in public health in our neighborhoods. And I think that's true across all neighborhoods in New York City, uh, mine in Bed-Stuy and yours, um, downtown Brooklyn. So I'm excited to participate in this conversation with you all and provide any support I can uh, for my Brooklyn neighbors. So I'll pass it back to Juliet and Brandon Smith. Thank you very much, Brandon. Um, I will call on you as we go through our statement of district needs and pick your brain on, on a lot of those items. Um, so uh, speaking of public safety as public health and um, rehabilitation, um, Brandon Smith is the chairperson of the Health Environment Human Services Committee, and he is going to speak with us about the, his professional experience in the community court system. Thanks, Juliet, and um, thanks for the opportunity to talk about this. Um, and thank you, Brandon, for a really uh, inspiring statement about uh, some pretty exciting work that's addressing a lot of the areas related to criminal justice. Um, I, I come from experience of having worked as a prosecutor for five years from 2009 to 2014. I worked as a prosecutor here in Brooklyn and uh, I, I worked in both the community court setting and in the, the regular, um, I guess, traditional court setting for both felony and misdemeanor crimes. And 
I, I, I walked away from that experience with, with a, a kind of unique perspective of having seen both sides of the, the prosecutor world and, and really seeing the benefits of community court. So um, I, I don't have any other particular specialized experience and there could be some other people who might be more uh, knowledgeable than me about this, just to make that clear. But um, I want to talk a little bit about community courts and about how they're different than regular courts so that we can think about possibly the benefit of what would be my my dream and about this issue is there would be effectively community courts in every local community in Brooklyn to handle nonviolent and misdemeanor crimes that are um, are of a substantially different nature than than the serious crimes that you see get uh, that go go into uh, felony court systems like attempted murders and, and armed robbery and such. Um, the community court is based around a theory of having one courtroom, one judge, and in many areas, particularly in the, at the Red Hook Community Justice Center, which is really the best model of a community court that exists, the, the judge handles criminal family and housing court cases. And the benefit of that is that the one judge and the one courtroom enables the judge to see parallel between the two cases, link them together. And within the courthouse, there is a, a clinic with uh, licensed social workers who are able to place individuals who are charged with crimes in into different programs that can ultimately be used in the same place of the really just traditional sanctions that exist in criminal law, jail, community service. Um, the, the value of it though is it, instead of having the jail, a more meaningful experience is, exists for the person who's charged and it goes along with the overall theory of the court, which is more on the problem solving side than the penalty punishment side of criminal law. And when defendants take a, a, a plea that exists uh, to and requires them to complete one of these programs, whether it be for mental health services, substance abuse services, maybe anger management or, or uh, there are specialized services for domestic violence, which are uh, which I've seen been be extremely effective and uh, people embrace and really turn their lives around in a, a remarkable experience. Um, but once these these are completed, people will walk out the door with their their case being dismissed with nothing on their record with uh, really the the alternative is the in the traditional setting. If you plead guilty to a misdemeanor crime, you're marked with that for the rest of your life. And if you if you have some other dispositions, it can be it can be very hard to get it wiped off your record. So a, a real clear benefit of having a community court is that you you, you have a, a much better situation towards solving the the problem, the underlying problem, whatever it is. You know, it might the crime might be stealing a loaf of bread, but the problem might be a substance abuse addiction or. Or, or some other kind of uh, personal issue. Um, so, you know, th these are the things that, that kind of make the community court set, setting better. Down in Red Hook, they cover three precincts, the 78th precinct, the, uh, uh, the 76th precinct, and the 72nd precinct, Sunset Park, Park Slope, and Red Hook. And the effect has been documented in several studies as reducing recidivism and, uh, and, and, and being a, a cheaper, approach even in in the in the sense that you don't that it results in less incarceration there's substantial substantially less uh people being incarcerated in the the time that i spent in the community court there was not one person that i saw go to jail involuntarily for a, a drug event believe it or not there are a few people in this world who would choose to go to jail rather than to go to treatment for a drug offense but the vast majority choose to be part of a program and and the, the effects are, are just amazing when, when you see people participate in these programs. Of course, you have to have a judge who's willing to give a lot of second chances and uh, to be pretty tolerant. Um, but uh, it, it, when, when you have that kind of a setting and when it's in a community-based atmosphere, like I think one of the big things that drove me to this feeling is that 
when we were sitting there with the close Rikers hearings last year and having people who come up and talk about their experience at Rikers, one of the real things that hit me was the discussion of how dehumanizing the experience was of being there. And when I think about 120 Skimmerhorn and the traditional court system, it has a similar sort of effect. And when you're looking at the seriousness of these offenses, offenses like trespass, criminal mischief, um, possession of a small amount of controlled substances, the, while these are, are, are things that are against the law, they're not, uh, they're, they're not, the, they're not at the level that um, they, they should be punished with such severe sanctions and such dehumanizing treatment. So having a community court really uh, addresses a number of those fashions, makes the community a lot better, and responds to, I, I think, part of the main concern that's associated with, um, with, with, with the, the, the massive protests and, and movements recently, which is that we need to have a systemic reform. We need to fundamentally change the way that we do justice across the board. And, you know, definitely that needs to take place with the police. Definitely that needs to take place with the prisons, but it also really needs to take place with the, the, the justice system. And I think from that, you know, the, the thought would be if we, if we would want to have a community court for the, the part of uh, our neighborhood in community district two, to handle the, the, these kind of nonviolent, um, or in some cases you have some very like minor violent cases where you have an assault and somebody doesn't have to go to the hospital or, or get hurt very bad. Sometimes those are, are good to be resolved in that area too. And it's all done very locally. So the court is closer to the, to the, the defendants, the victims, the, the witnesses, and it, it, it really just promotes a much better situation overall. I probably have gone on a little bit too long about that, but I, I'll stop there and, and see if anybody has any questions or, or thoughts. Thank you, Brandon. Um, I, I would be happy to open it up to um, member questions before we dive into the statement of <laughs> needs of either Mr. Smith or Mr. Holmes. I, I will ask a question of both gentlemen. Have you had any exposure to the organization called Gangsters Making Astronomical Astronomical Community Changes? Are you familiar with that organization? Yeah, I'm familiar with uh, GMAC. Um, I know Rashawn Brown uh, and Shan Duke. Yep. Yeah, they so, were close partners of the campaign in the past. So they are actually in some way connected to your organization and are uh, become a referral source because that organization, as I understand it, is heavily invested in the communities that are most in need. And they're located here, at least one of their outfits are located here on Myrtle Avenue. And they do a lot of work in the Fort Greene Public Housing Project. Yeah, GPEX is a great, uh, so that's one of the organizations, just in case there's other folks on the call who might not be familiar with them. Uh, they do a lot of uh, gun prevention and gun uh, seizure work, I guess, like getting folks to turn in firearms um, without having fear of, you know, retaliation or repercussions. They've taken a lot of guns off the street. They've also been able to do a lot of uh, violence mediation. So if there is going to be violence or there's going to be a fight, uh, they have trained cure violence mediators and mentors who will go into communities and talk to folks on the ground um, and try to present alternative solutions so that folks don't have to resort to violence. Um, they recently had a contract to also provide services and connect with people on Rikers Island and in New York City jails. And I believe this year that may have expired. Um, and also with COVID, it's just been difficult for them to continue having that presence inside the jails um, since the jails have had a really high contraction infection rate. Um, so I'd say GMAC is definitely an organization, though, that when you're talking about these alternative conflict resolution models that don't require millions of dollars to be funneled into the NYPD or into jails, this is a kind of group that is a local group um, that has like trained, you know, credible messengers um, and can do a lot more with that money uh, than the NYPD is able to do. Thank you for that. Uh, my other request is that the information that you have provided this evening, along with 
Brandon, is very helpful and needs to be further distributed. This committee doesn't necessarily have a mechanism for getting the word out that describes all of the uh, work that you are doing. And we need to get much more buy-in from the community. More folk need to know exactly or have a sense of what you're doing and maybe some suggestions or ideas as to how we can get uh, improvement and, 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 and better results. So my request is for some kind of description or website or some way of knowing what exactly it is that you described that we can share with a larger community. Sounds great, John. And um, in in the chat um, box, Brandon Holmes did send a link to a couple oh. links um, that uh, may be helpful. Maybe we can get the the district office at least to distribute it internally, and then talk about some wider distribution. Were there any other uh, questions or comments? I appreciate the. Juliet, I'm going to say this, it might be a little sensitive, but I appreciate the ebony and ivory of the two Brandons. <laughs> <laughs> I uh, Juliet. Yes, Sandy. So, um, yeah, I, I was on the NAC with with Brandon and uh, the NAC is the, um, you know, it was really run by the uh, Mock J, the Mayor's Office of Criminal Justice, and we really didn't, in my opinion, um, have a voice. We got present, we were given presentations and updates. Um, and that process was about the rezoning of four separate sites in four different boroughs. Um, and I know Brandon, Brandon um, you know, I know his agenda well from from the experience of working with him, and I, I agree. And I felt that that process was backwards. That we should have started with uh, with the reforms and services and changing the culture of the um, corrections offices. And so I'm hoping now. I mean, I think because of the budget. Uh, the, the pandemic and, and the budget, I think the building is going to be delayed and we're trying to find out from Councilman Levin, who's not responding, but um, to see if we can start to reevaluate um, the whole thing that was pushed through for, in my opinion, political reasons. So, I mean, I agree with um, uh, what Brandon and Brandon, is that right? to Brandon's, um, uh, and the city's not going to be safer or better until uh, there are investments in the in the communities, um, you know, from housing to health to everything, um, nice, you know, everything it, it, to pack, to put all the resources into these giant jails never made sense to me because because the focus needs to be on on building the communities and making the communities stronger so um, that's so I hope we can you know have start to focus on that and yeah. have our councilman who's still here for a year to um, who supported uh, pushing through the, you know, the mega jail plan to um, start to let the the people in the community um, have a voice and decide how the funding should be spent. Thank you. Yeah. I appreciate that. Yes, and I feel like that is a really good context for us starting the um, conversation about um, the public safety. Um, initiatives in our statement of district needs if we're if we're ready to move to that now. Juliet. Um, oh yes. 
Uh, it's zero. I, I had a question for Brandon. I'm, I'm very interested in the community court system. Uh, I know we spoke about it well a while back that it's in Red Hook. Brandon, but what? where is it in the court system? Is that the only community court that we have in the city? It's not the only one that we have in the city, but it's the only one that really works in a in a in a comprehensive manner for for people of all ages. Uh, there, there's been an effort that took some time to get a community court started in Brownsville, and I, as I understand it, I'm not the most familiar with the Brownsville community court, but I understand it focuses on uh, on younger people, whereas the Red Oak community court focuses on people of all ages, and. The um, it sits in the misdemeanor court system, but it's important to note that it handles arraignments, and it's the only it's the only court outside of the um, outside of the regular 120 Skimmerhorn atmosphere that handles arraignments. And because many cases get a, a get resolved at arraignment, it's it's very important to have um, a judge who is is really in touch with the community, lives in the community, knows the local community. Um, making the decisions and being a part of the of of those cases, and then it handles the cases all the way through trial. Now you're not going to have jury trials in a in a in a community court. That I think is probably better for a uh, uh, for a downtown court because it's difficult with getting all of the people to, into a um, into a jury, uh, all, all the all the potential jurors to go out to uh, um, a, a smaller community court. But the having it in a having it in a one room court um, courtroom in a in a in a community creates a much different atmosphere, and it actually makes the whole system a lot faster. So you don't have these cases that last for years and years; they get resolved actually very quickly. Um, well, um, as a follow up, I, I, why? Uh, I, I'm, it's probably a rhetorical question. If it's been how long has it been in existence, and how if it was so successful? Why hasn't it been expanded just automatically within the court system? I mean, I, I'm sure you don't have the quite the answer to it, but right. it's a rhetorical question. The way that we should really be, as a committee, or looking at that and saying, why can't that be expanded? It seems to be successful. You said the recidivism is very low. That that in itself is a big plus. So I just was wondering why no one has taken up the yeah. mantle to push it. Well, I, I I can't speak for the for, no, I'm for sure. why why it isn't everywhere, but but as I understand, you know, in some com in some communities there is a, a nimbyism about having a court in your in your neighborhood, and in in other in in other areas, um, you have to get a number you have to get a number of parties on board. You know, you have to get the district attorney's office, you have to get the off the OCA, the court administration, you have to get uh, Department of Corrections on board to get and it takes a lot of coordination um, and effort to get the um, to get a, a number of people on board with the uh, with the idea. And then there's also a nonprofit that manages uh, these community courts called the Center for Court Innovation, which uh, they're a really wonderful organization. But you know, you, they have to be part of the conversation too. So there, it's it's it is a big process to get a lot of these people speaking to each other, but it, it, at the end, if it can work out, and and it really has in 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 other parts of the world, there have been these community courts created in places as far away as Australia, Europe, and uh, and such. That it just it, it, it takes a, a good a lot of coordination, and that's probably part of the story too. Thank you. You also have to find a building. You also have to find a building for it too. So I, I think that speaks to, um, you know, this is something that we want um, to advocate for. It has to be a high priority on our list. You know, things that are in the 20s, 30s and 40s are not going to really get um, looked at or funded. Um, but I, I think that it's something that we really haven't heard so much about. As Brandon said, it's not as uh, widespread throughout the throughout the court system this 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 alternative uh, community courts and um, you know we really I, I you know we have a site you know we have 120 Scrimmerhorn that is supposed to be redeveloped into both a traditional court and um, a detention center you know they that may be a feasible although it is not as 
community oriented as as I think Brandon would prefer, it's it's a real site that could be used to incorporate a community court. Um, so I'm going to now share my screen so that um, we can get into our um, district needs, which Carol Ann has put into um, Excel form that I just formatted a little bit and added um, a couple of um, line items for us to talk about and think about. So the way this is organized is, um, is from our original budget priorities, but it's capital requests for public safety and emergency services. Oh, sorry, can everybody see my screen? Yes. Okay, can, is it big enough for you to read? Uh. Make it bigger? <laughs> Should I make it bigger? No, yet, I would say I would say no. I think it needs to be bigger. Yeah, I think bigger. How's that? That's better. Okay, great. I'm having to reduce it, but that's okay. Okay. You would, John. <laughs> <laughs> be nice, zero. <laughs> so, capital requests, public safety and emergency services, expense requests, public safety and emergency services possible additions that I sent around in an email that we can talk about and uh, obviously open to you know the whole discussion. And then transportation, I put second because of our speakers to um, you know give them the sort of opportunity if they didn't want to stay for the transportation part, we could follow up with that um, transportation and expense requests, cap uh, capital and expense requests. And then in the major needs, one of the top three issues of course, being the triple cantilever of the BQE in, in terms of public safety. is misspelled. <laughs> yes, it is. <laughs> I think Carol, Carol Ann literally like retyped the whole thing by hand. So, no. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> so maybe it's the OCR. <laughs> Need a lot of, okay. And then um, noting in terms of public safety and emergency services, you know, this was from last year where shooting incidents have increased to wide again, shooting incidents have increased year over year. So we'll get into that as well in the review of the ComStat report during the chair's report. Um, and this is again, the triple cantilever. And I think this is more of a statement of transportation and traffic infrastructure that maybe we can look into rewarding a little bit. To, um, speak more towards needs in that regard. Can can we, before we get more deeply into the report, are we still functioning under the unwritten rule that it's only the top 10 requests that are going to get even looked at mm -hmm. by the respective city agencies? Carol Ann, can you speak to that? Well, I, I don't know that city planning or any of the agencies would um, admit to that statement, but I do believe that, you know, priority number one is more likely to get funded than priority number 25. And see, and, and we had this happen before. The BQE remains our number one priority. It's everyone's number one priority. So should that remain our number one priority when it's already been adopted by every other city agency and everybody is working on it. This should be moved to follow up and something else should become our number one priority. Really good point. All right, let's 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 keep thinking about that as we go through our priorities and see if something else bumps up. So would you guys like to go through our existing priorities and then um, into recommendations, or would you like to talk about the possible additional things that we can add to the, our lists? Additional. Okay, great. So perfect, you know, we've got um, Brandon Holmes and Brandon Smith here. Number one thing is rethinking criminal justice. So, I have one line item here, support the creation of a community court to handle cases in uh, community district two. Is that something, um, you know, do we want to add more color to that? Do we want to say potentially in 120 Skirmerhorn? 
Well, I think if we can get specific, it would make that that statement, I think, give that statement a little more weight. I mean, have we ever, uh, of course, I'm back in the committee, I'm not sure. Has this ever been on the list? No. The community court system? Oh, I'm sorry, not since I've been on the committee, but John or Caroline, you can speak more to that. Okay, Sarah, what question were you asking? I, I was looking at the uh, community court system since Brandon was so articulate in his presentation. Uh, I and, and the importance of it seems to be so clear cut. I was wondering, was this ever put on our uh, needs list before? No, we have ever, to the best of my knowledge, discussed a separate court system. Court system. Well, I, I think I, I would say if we could put more detail, I don't know the exact wording, but it would be, I think it would give it much more impact because I think it's quite important, especially now. Okay, I think we can craft something that is a little bit more um, explanatory of the reason why we are supporting it. Yes. Yeah. Yes. And Juliet, if I could just build on, if we are developing, but uh, talking about fiscal priorities, we have to assess that this is something that is even viable before it's designated as a priority. So is there a thought process in the city of New York about expanding of the program that Brandon just described yeah, to us? That's something that we need to begin to feed out before we make it a priority. Right. I mean, that's I, a good point. I, I, I want us to be able to attach a finance to what it is that yeah. we are prioritizing and the other stuff can be handled in a separate way. I suspect even if we support this, it's going to be years in the making. Similar to, you know, we had a we had creation of a, an elementary school in downtown Brooklyn um, subsequent <laughs> to the 2004 rezoning. We had that as a top priority for many years before DOE decided to fund the new school in downtown Brooklyn. And that is not going to open until 20 years after the 2004 rezoning. Um, I think that how, I mean, Brandon, you can speak more about the process if you know of um, how the Red Hook um, um, Community Court Center got approved. But the way you explained it, it seemed like there's so many levels of, of um, sort of uh, bureaucracy really to get that we'd have to get through and really this is just the tip of the iceberg so you know i think it's great to add as i as as a priority so that people start thinking about it but not expect it to be funded in any you know in this year or next year yeah, i think we should link it uh link it to the um to the jail um okay. so because it's to be a capital thing instead of an expense thing um well, I, I guess you need a building, as as Brandon said. Um, uh, but but you know, with 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 the jail plan, which you know was poorly executed, but based on I thought you know, and I think a lot of us think really fundamental and important principles. Uh, one of those principles was providing social services within that environment, and this is this is like a this is a key would be a key social service, you know, like being treating people like human beings rather than pushing them through the factory at uh, on Skirmore, you know, so um, if we, so, I, so, if we so Brandon, uh, given your level of expertise in this area, I certainly am very interested in understanding more about what goes on there in Red Hook and how look to incorporate something like that. What kind of document do you have again in writing? I'm always going to ask for this because I think we have to have a written document that puts people as close to being on the same page as how we are looking and understanding what we want to happen. Do you have what you described earlier in a document or is that in that email that I'm going to get from you that just uh, Obtained. A 
Uh, Brandon? Okay. I don't know. If, yeah, I'm not. I'm unclear which Brandon you're speaking to, but I do have a bit of a community board, Brandon. Uh, I... Yeah, I, I I pasted a a link in the in the chat, which is a PDF, okay. which is a complete research uh, document that uh, that explains soup to nuts, everything about how how it works, the study, its effectiveness, and and the the the, the proof that it works. Do you also have in there the contact folk that were involved in getting it set up? I think that the 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 contact folk who the the key contact folk are the people who this report's website is on the the Center for Court Innovation. Okay. They're 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 probably the key contact folk because they're the nonprofit that operates these in the in the city. That's great. That's a great idea. That not for profit, and maybe even we can get them to come to. Right. Julia. 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 This is Carol Ann. I just want to note that um, a request can be both capital and expense if it breaks out that way. I see. So the programmatic part can be an expense request while mm -hmm. the building itself is capital. Okay. You can help us with, with figuring that out. Sounds good. And Julia, it's John. Quinn. Yes, John. Um, I don't think, and I don't think we're going to do anything about writing a priority or writing a, a request, but I wouldn't, I would recommend not linking it to 120 Skimmerhorn in any way, because I think the whole idea of the community court is to be, is to be distinct from the whole criminal court system. And, and no matter how much, how, how they change 120, even if they build a building twice as big, you know, Parkinson's law is going to apply and the space is going to expand to fill whatever there is. So, and, and because the Brandon Smith noted that the community court in Red Hook covers three precincts. So if we're going to have, if they're going to do three precincts in, in a downtown Brooklyn community court, it's going to, I think it's going to have to be more East, you know, towards the, towards the 88th and not within the 84th, because the whole idea is to make the community court not a criminal court, is to make it a place where, you know, the criminal aspect of it is not the most important thing. So I think we should be looking for a, a location away from the central courts. That That is the idea, John, but they really pitched us that this new um, detention center was supposed to be, um, you know, a completely re-envisioned um, perspective on the detention center, a more humane um, place well, with social services and all that stuff. Yeah, but that's for people who have been, that's for people who are above the cutoff line that Brandon Smith has been talking about. And he noted that it doesn't deal with just criminal cases, it deals with family court and housing cases. It's really, it's a, the, everything that would go, that goes to Red Hook would not go into any house of detention. They're talking about services for people who are charged with violent crimes, whether they be misdemeanors or not, and anybody charged with felonies. So I think the idea is that, that the community court would deal with the issues that would never put people in the house of detention. I mean, I'll check to okay. Brandon Smith to to we'll comment on that, but I, I don't think, I, I think that the services that Corrections is gonna provide are not the kind of services that the uh, uh, Red Hill Community Court would provide and any other, and a downtown community court would provide. Brandon Holmes, can I ask you what you think about that? Yeah, um, yeah, I appreciate John's attention to that detail that these community courts, the idea is that they're supposed to be distinctly separate from the government, from, you know, from the punitive system. Um, and I think like that is something that has made that Red Hook court wildly successful. Um, but one thing I, you know, I do want to also uplift is what Juliet said about like these future facilities being like, something that can be shaped and imagined. And if that is the only court that is operable, if that's the only court that we're going to use and we're going to say, 
okay, we're moving away from the punitive system altogether, um, and we can like you know reconfigure the system in that sense. Then yes, you could kill two birds with one stone. But I think with a recognition that like these criminal courts are not going anywhere, that there's still going to be folks who are accused of violent felonies and therefore are not bail eligible and are not eligible for any of the pre arraignment diversion programs. I think that's the challenge here and like making sure whatever leadership has oversight of this facility, if you make it the jail, it's going to be whatever pre trial services agency there is. It's not going to be like the Department of Social Services, I think is the concern that I share with John. But uh, I would also share there, there have been some pre existing commitments already made around the city funding, doing, committing annual funding to the expansion of pre arraignment diversion um, and community based restorative justice programs. I'm going to post that in here um, in case someone from CB2 uh, from staff is able to kind of check out that language in those notes. Um, those commitments in total, like across the city, they were talking about expanding pre arraignment diversion with $3.5 million in funding. Um, or sorry, across the borough of Brooklyn, they were talking about 3.5 million in funding. I think if you were to demand that 3.5 million, it kind of just reinforces that like 3.5 million dollars is not a lot of money to keep thousands of people out of jail when today it's costing us about 330 thousand dollars a year to keep one person in New York City jail. So. I think these are like small dollar amounts that you can definitely pinpoint to. I think John was saying he wanted a dollar amount. You can definitely pinpoint it from some of this language. And these are things that have already been committed to. So you can know these are the things that like the mayor's office and the DAs are more in line with like supporting or approving moving forward. So Brandon, um, I just uh, took some notes from what you said, um, and I just wrote down, given that it costs over $300,000 to keep one person in jail, increase the approved um, or the, uh, the approved city, the approved $3.5 million in city funding for pre arraignment diversion. Yep, that's, that language sounds good. Okay. And um, what are some of the programs that it would be funding? Like, are we supporting not for profits? Are we like, is it going directly into, you know, a city a court system? So these specific commitments I shared here, uh, the one for expanding pre arraignment diversion is in collaboration with the district attorneys and the office of court administration. So that would be expanding services um, and funding that like DA Gonzalez has already been invested in. Most of the investments he's made are in like youth diversion, um, but that's slowly expanding. There are two buckets though that are specific to one community-based restorative justice, um, which would be similar to you know what GMAC does as like a community-based service provider, doing that violence interruption and conflict resolution model. Um, and then the other one is a justice innovation fund which I'm not super familiar about, but this is like uh, a public private partnership that would essentially allow folks to create new types of programming or invest in new types of programming. Um, so this is kind of like when we talk about Red Hook Community Justice Center um, or initiative, they, them operating that community court, this would be like the justice fund that would be established in Brooklyn would be the mechanism that uh, an organization like GMAC or like CCI or another group would be able to submit an RFP to say, we know what type of community based restorative justice programs would be most successful in this community. Therefore, like we've applied to this fund in the city of New York, you give it, give the resources to us uh, and we'll operate this program. So that's what CCI does and other groups do now around restorative justice programs. This would just be creating a fund specific to Brooklyn um, that came in, you know, with the whole conversation and negotiations around the borough based facilities. These were just commitments to funding these three areas outside of those jails. And Brandon, um, what you just described and you did attach that $300,000 per inmate 
uh, uh, at Rikers Island, do you have a way of quantifying the benefits of the Red Hook outside of the human aspect of it, the financial savings that the uh, government derives from this organization? How long has it been in effect? Is, that, is this for me or the other Brandon? Uh, it's for Brandon Ebony. I'm, I'm sorry, Brandon. Ebony. Whichever one wants to speak to it, but I'm, I'm, not, I'm not Ebony. I'm going on mute. <laughs> I, don't, I don't have an exact uh, cost savings number from the community court, um, but what I can say is as the as the jail population has decreased steadily, we have not seen a reduction in the workforce of the Department of Corrections or in the operating budget of the Department of Corrections. So we're still spending the same amount per year as if we incarcerated 11,000 New Yorkers, um, even oh, wow. below 4,000. This year was the first year we saw a significant decrease in the DOC budget, and that was okay. like 200 or 300 million dollars. Um, so right now there's what I can give you as like a strong number to support your language is there are 5,000 uh, excess corrections officers to every person to uh, individuals in custody. Um, so our, we are actually paying more to staff our jails than we actually have people who are actually detained and incarcerated in our jails. So when we're talking about where this money can come from, there's very clear sources of where this money can come from. Uh, such as, you know, the NYPD demands that were made, the DOC demands, um, and the district attorneys are also given money for these specific things. So it would just be a matter of making sure they allocate the money effectively. So as we go forward with putting a program together, and Juliet, we should talk about uh, the follow-up to this. I think it would be helpful if we have examples of the savings that would be derived uh, in addition to the otherwise human elements of this particular program. It should be a full program, and there are certain folk that are only going to answer to the monetary aspect of it. So we should have everything as well as we can in one program so that it can sell to everybody at the same time. Just my comment. <laughs> Sounds good. Sounds good. Um, Mr. Holmes, if I could, um, you, you spoke very quickly. Um, I wanted to um, get a couple things from you. You were mentioning the reduction in the incarcerated population. Was it from 20,000 to under 4,000? Uh, 11,000. So 11,000 was where we were at uh, around 20, the end of 2016 going to 2017. Um, and today we are below 4,000. And and we're suggesting that maybe we reallocate funding from the Department of Corrections or what department um, oversees the detention system? Yep, that would be the Department of Corrections. Okay. And in terms of the um, funding for pre-arraignment diversion, um, it was in collaboration with the district attorney and one other partner. I missed it. Uh, the courts, the Office of Court Administration. It's good to be specific. Thank you. So establishment of a justice fund. So I think we have another one. And and the establishment would be redirected from the Department of Corrections. Okay. Recent, do we want to um, make any other um, Recommend specific recommendations on due process, bail reform. I feel like you know those those items may be more higher level than the community board level discussion and may not exactly be funding related, but I think the community court system will improve due process as well. Um, Brandon, if you could you know speak to the speed of the um, the process. Oh my God, yeah, I, I can totally do that. Let me say this. In the year 2010, I, as a prosecutor, declared 
ready for trial, meaning the people were ready to start trial on 45 consecutive cases without being once sent out to trial. That's in the regular court system. Because in, in, ha in, having, a, in having a criminal court system where you have to go to a different court part to conduct the trial, it's a matter of finding the courtroom, having everybody available, and a lot of judges don't want to do trials because it, it takes a long time to do trials. So um, they 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 may not they may not uh, want to accept it. Uh, as a res there there are different. It, it is probably a lot faster now because we have a much more progressive DA now than we did back then. But um, and we have a much more progressive uh, court system than we had back then. But um, but in the uh, in the Red Hook system, in my first year there, you know, I, I did 11 trials. It was incredible that you, you the, the caseloads are smaller and it, it allows the whole system to work a lot faster. And the judge will just stop court in the middle of the day and say, let's do a trial. And you do a trial. And then at the end of that, you go back to doing some more cases. And it's a much easier, faster system, and you don't have these cases. And I know that you have these cases in reg in the regular court system, both felony and misdemeanor, actually, which just take years and years to to prosecute and and resolve. And it really works to everyone's detriment because two years after the after the the incident, everyone has a worse memory. Oftentimes, the police officer retired, and the uh, there, there really isn't a, a, a sense of justice that's involved, and it, it doesn't work. But you know, the, the system just doesn't work as fairly, I think. Brandon, is it not the case that less than two percent of all cases actually make it to trial? Well, I, I I don't know the statistics off the top of my head, and I'm not going to pretend to. But 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 it's very accurate that the overwhelming majority of cases don't go to trial. The overwhelming majority of cases go to um, uh, go, get resolved in a plea deal. And yes, yes. But I think it, you know it, the, the goal it, is to try to make a system where everybody has the right to to have their case go to trial if they want. You know, they they can accept the plea or they can go to trial and um the 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 system in the community courts allows it to to work a lot faster so at least it isn't the court system that's the cause of the of the of the issue well many cases are settled because the defendant settles for time served and so it gets that person out of the jail and out of the system so it, it's certainly a single digit low single digit number of cases that actually go to trial. One of the nice things, I'm not positive that Brandon mentioned it, um, but once um, the, um, the person who um, pled in the community court system goes to the goes through their program and completes it, that plea that whatever, if it was a misdemeanor plea or whatever it was, that gets removed from their record. So it doesn't follow them if they're applying for a job or applying for housing or whatever. So it's, you know, that's one of um the other benefits of, of that so i wanted to keep going um are there any other um brandon holmes alternative to incarceration programs that uh you think we should be mentioning here should we maybe support like youth-based programs and um I, I guess that would be broader than the public safety context yeah, um, I, I think one area um, that folks are seeing is very effective is transitional housing. Um, so there's a lot of conversation around affordable housing, but transitional housing for and removing barriers to housing um, and getting into whether it be affordable housing or public housing for people who are uh, justice involved. Um, a lot of folks who are homeless also have come into contact with law enforcement or the justice system um, and kind of addressing that it would be transitional or supportive housing models such as uh, what we've seen operated by Fortune Society or Osborne Association folks in Brooklyn may be familiar with um, the Doe Fund is another group that folks in downtown Brooklyn may be familiar with but supporting that type of housing for folks who are justice involved to transition back into affordable or public housing 
Um, and there's been a program that the city just started this year for folks who are being released from Rikers. They do uh, a lot of, you know, case management work and like, uh, work with the service providers from uh, one of the groups I can cite that's running one of these programs is Exodus Transitional Community. Um, and they essentially like support folks in figuring out a game plan when they're released, like how are you know how are you getting connected to housing? How are you getting connected to employment opportunities, um, education? So having those types of models be funded at scale is great because it also reduces recidivism and the likelihood that someone is going to end up homeless or back in right. the justice system. Thank you. Sounds great. Um uh, Juliet? Yes, Sandy. Oh, good. Um, I just want to go back because I wanted to say something and I couldn't get in. Um, to John, John Quinn's point, and I think something that Brendan said, um, you know, uh, Judge Littman, who recommended closing Rikers and did the report, he did, he envisioned services um, in the community, not in one big facility. He didn't envision one big facility. And so um, I think the, you know, the idea of, of bringing the services to the communities, uh, like the Red Hook um, court that seems to be working very well, is, is really what was envisioned. And, and the mayor, the politics of this whole thing you know, just put everything in one giant jail and that doesn't uh, bring it to the community or yeah. in, integrate it in the community. So I just wanted to say that. I know we passed that, but. Oh no, that was that was good to pick that up again. Um, does anybody else have an objection? Because, you know, we have both perspectives in the um, discussion, have an objection to removing the link to 120 Scrimmerhorn and really focusing on community courts as an expense item and a little bit more conceptually rather than concretely in that building. I think that makes sense. Okay. They, is, is, they should be separated. Okay. What, what's 120 Scrimmerhorn? Is that, is that the jail or, yeah. or the court? That's the court. That's the criminal court building. Okay, so is it is it okay to connect it to the jail project? Well, it is, you know, it's no. right, the block above it. The, the two right, it, it, the, the new jail project has a traditional court component to it. Uh, right, okay. Um, I just thought I thought it would it would add sort of relevance if we if we referenced the the jail project in our in our in our proposal, but but I I I, I would go along with the uh, expertise that of others who are better better informed than me. I I, I um think the way you do, Patrick. But I will we'll also yes, I will also go along with um, the consensus. That we. Should. I just wanted to say I really supported what Mr. Quint said about that. I thought that was really eloquent, um, and I, I'm very much of the same belief that it should be in the community. Yeah. yeah, and Brandon had mentioned, you know, the um the the you know if it could focus on just the 84th and 88th, that would probably be better rather than focusing on a larger um section of Brooklyn. So maybe I can put that in. I said CD2, but I, maybe I can be more specific of the 84th and 88th. Yeah, I de I definitely agree with what John said. I I wasn't yeah. in any case. That yes, was, yes, it this, does, this it does matter. Very, yeah, it, very yeah. helpful. But from the also from a feasibility standpoint, you know, sometimes it's nice to have a concrete place for it too, and then it's a little bit um, less pie in the sky. Although, you know, it's the city has a lot of resources in downtown Brooklyn, and they can find another place. Um, accountability. You know, this is another um, area Mr. Holmes has expertise in. Um, is there? Um, We've been hearing about the CCRB and how they don't have a lot of um, actual power. You know, is what? How can we? Um, and luckily, the the state passed um, recent legislation that does does um, help to expose officer records and increase accountability. But what else can we do from a you know budget priority perspective? Didn't they in the laws that they passed, including the council? 
They gave it to TRB more power. They gave it to the microphone. I, I unmuted. Can you hear me now? Yes. Yeah, it was just talking to yeah, the microphone. Get, I'll get closer to the microphone. Now, in the laws yeah, yeah. that they passed, including the city council, they gave the CCRB much more power. They, they okay. increased the power of the CCRB already. So uh, uh, they're, 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 they significantly increased the power. Okay. Can you circulate that information to uh, Juliet? Uh, to the sure I, I'm sure I can find it. Thanks, Ed. It may take me a minute or two. I'll go back to view. I do think one core area is that this is right um, because of the repeal of 50A, and then there's a lingering court battle to actually release the disciplinary records of officers that uh, the New York Civil Liberties Union actually just yesterday was able to release over 300,000 uh, records of police misconduct. So now that is public information, I think an acknowledgement from community boards all across the city an acknowledgement that community boards support this type of accountability and transparency and support access to or public access to information uh, would be really great, you know, especially in the current moment with the energy around um, police accountability and reform. And I think you know if if the group were to take it a step further i think supporting the what has been the popular demand for uh divesting one billion dollars from the uh six billion dollar budget of the nypd divesting from that um and one of the major things that i think uh, aligns with what i saw your previous statement of needs um one thing could be removing police officers from public schools uh, and investing that money and those resources instead in fully staffing guidance counselors and you know mental health supportive services for students in schools. Um, what we saw this year was a popular demand and a lot of movement towards uh, taking one million dollars out of the NYPD budget and moving it to other community resources. What the end result was was about four hundred million dollars. Uh, that got taken out of the NYPD budget and put into the Department of Education. And that $400 million is still being used to hire police officers to be in public schools. So it, it was kind of this weird, funky math that city council did to work their way around that. Um, but I think popular demand from many folks, especially uh, parents, has been to remove police officers from schools and uh, Put the accountability on DOE to hire and staff guidance counselors in school. And this this is going to already posted on the uh, chat a, a link to one of the articles. CCRB's power has been increased. Thank you, Sid. I couldn't hear Sid. Is he? Did he? I said, He's sharing. I said sharing that, the link to that article that he spoke about with the um, the CCRB uh, uh, their authority thank being you. increased. Thank you. Um, is there a way to be able to save those links at the end of our uh, meeting, Carol Ann or Kea? Maybe Carol Ann, you could copy them, and so we can all have them after the meeting ends. Yes. Great. I've been doing that actually. Oh, perfect. Tay has also been dumping them in, into our file. We have them. Perfect. <laughs> so, is there consensus about adding this one as a priority, um, removing uh, or support the removal of police officers who are now working for the uh, Department of Education from public schools and increasing DOE funding for guidance counselors and staff? I would agree with that. Uh -uh. Cheryl, you're you're muted. We want to hear you. Can you hear me now? Yes. You hear me now? Yes, we hear you. Uh, so you're saying that you don't need school safety officers in school? All you need is guidance counselors? I don't agree with that. I still think you need school safety officers. When I went to high school, my high school had 
unfortunately the highest arrest rate in all of Chicago. Um, in the beginning, there were no metal detectors and we started adding metal detectors. Um, but we, we did not have a police officer in the school. We had a, um, I don't even know exactly what his, what his exact title was, but we had somebody who knew every single face in that 2000 person public school that it later became 4,000 persons. And, you know, if there was somebody that walked into that school that did not go to that school, this person would know and he would call you out on it. So I think there, there, there are ways to deal with public safety on a personal on a, um, staff level on, you know, that is not necessarily police officers. That's my personal experience. You know, other people can share, you know, how, how they feel. I, I would say a, just a blanket statement about that may be too, too general to say, because there are, I, I, I'm more interested in trying to, if you take something from the budget of the police budget, we should be looking at some so, social services and things like that. I mean, that should be our focus to try to take the money from policing from the, the police can't do uh, social servicing. They, they, their job is different. We should be encouraging uh, something to the effect of social services and helping psychologically. Uh, th that is more interesting to me. Police officers are there to intimidate and or arrest. That's not what the school system should be about. It should not be a culture to have police protection all the time. <laughs> I grew up and I never saw a police officer anywhere near my school. I don't know why, how that got incorporated. It, it seems so inappropriate. It sends the wrong message to the students that the atmosphere in which they are being educated is dangerous enough that an officer or more have to be found. I actually visit a number of schools on a regular basis for family members and the police officer is at the entrance to the building, more of a social kind of an atmosphere, clearly, but in uniform, and it doesn't seem necessary. It could be accomplished with someone else that has a similar responsibility as the police officer has. The police officer, why is that police officer there? Do they expect there to be a crime committed every day? Do they think the police officer is an intimidating factor to the students? You know, we have to take a look at this on a much larger police officer that was a response that permeated the entire system. No one's going back to evaluate its need or whether it should be adjusted to a lesser person. I think we have to look at all of that, but assuming that a police officer to be in every school, I think is too much. So now, is it right now? Are they in every school, or um, how is the, the personnel allocated? That four hundred million dollars? They're spread out across most uh, public schools. When you look at non-public schools, no, they're typically not police officers in there. But there is an MOU. Uh, with the Department of Education and the NYPD that says that they have to keep those jobs in schools right now. Yeah, no, there's school safety officers in every school. There are some police officers in schools that are high risk. Police make decisions of them. Right now, there's a school safety officer in every public school in New York City. And as I pointed out, when I went to high school in 1960, we had a police officer in uniform with a gun. Right? Uh -huh, with a gun. Oh my God. In New York. Now, oh my God. Some of this goes back to problems that they had in Colorado and Connecticut, where, where yeah. it become a real problem with people coming into school with guns. Right. So that the school, but, but that, but the, the school safety and the, and they lock the doors so that you know 
you know, yep. if you have they a, still do that. If you have a kid in preschool now, right? You go into a school and they, those schools, those schools, a new school for a preschool student is fortified in a way that it's very difficult for people to enter, and they only enter from one door, right? That is a problem in New York, and it's been a problem in New York because of how the schools are designed. And that's another issue. But I agree that for the most part, that can be done with a non-police officer. But someone, you know, the school safety officers are not police officers. They're under the control of the police department, but they're not police officers, right? And, and they're not armed. They're, the, the school safety officers are unarmed. But so, Sid, are you in support or not of removing the school safety officers? I, I, I think there needs to be some sort of school security, but I don't think it should be under the form uh, under the police department. I think it's, it's not anymore. It's under the DOE now. They the, the right. they got reallocated. Right, and that they should also train those people not to just be monitoring the door, but also being there to assist in in, in the social work and stuff like that. So they're really integrated into the school process. <clears throat> So it's like remove slash retrain school safety officers in public schools. Um, well, Julia, we would have we would have to put in conjunction with the school principals because we can't make decisions for every school and make a uniform decision. And there are some schools that may have a different relationship with their community where they think they need to have a police officer. Yeah. In front of so I yeah. uh, think we got to protect But I also think that, frankly, when I knew the police officer at the high school, I was, tr I, I was not treated like people of color, frankly. All right. And that's a problem. I mean, that's a, right. that's a black life ma matters. Is that, that that police officer did not treat me badly? You know, the one thing I do have to say is uh, many of the school safety officers in that four hundred million dollars of funding are people of color, are women, and you know, cutting them completely also cuts these people out of jobs potentially. Yeah, I I would like to say that when we think about New York City for the next few <laughs> years, we're we're looking at like pockets of organized abandonment and like austere violence across budgets. And so when we think about spending money on police or school security guards instead of services, that is doing harm, especially to people who are black and brown. And I, I'm very much in favor of removing all police from schools and removing the security officers in uh, exchange for more counselors who mm -hmm. are also typically women of color. Mm -hmm. Yep. Um, Emily, uh, did you want to make some annotation on the screen? Ms. Blount? Or was that a mistake? All right, I'm going to take the sharing back. All right, so I'm going to rephrase. Hello, hello, I'm sorry, Julia. I just wanted to say thank you for saying that most of the school safety officers are women of color. A lot of them are single parents, and to get rid of those would really dem dem it would really hurt a lot of women. I know quite a few, and they make a good salary, and they it's their way to become middle class, and it would be very hurtful. Yeah. Thank you. I want to just comment uh, on that too. Uh, it is a great point to bring up, and one of the things that made it so difficult to invest from uh, NYPD in the first place, um, kind of using those women, those women of color, as like a shield to not take money from NYPD. I think what's important to think about. So, someone Jenna Gogan put it in chat right before I was able to say it. Uh, the, the, that we should be talking about how we transition to uh, an economy and a system that invests in guidance counselors and social services and the well-being of people and not just saying you're losing these jobs and that's it for you, but saying you're losing these jobs and maybe there's a way for 
you to be able to get intentional training, right? This isn't something that'll happen in the blink of an eye. This is going to take a while to be able to talk to the unions about how it's going to happen, people's you know pensions and all that. But to say, we're going to reallocate this money to training you, to prepare you to take on these social service jobs that we need and we're going to need to expand in the future. Um, I think there's a way to acknowledge that language while at the same time saying these jobs, you know, the same as I've got cousins who are corrections officers. I still want to see a world without prisons, despite the fact that my family directly profits and makes their income off of that. I want to see a world where they don't have to work in prisons in order to make a living and, you know, to survive. So I think there's a way we can acknowledge that without saying it's either or it's black or white. I, I think we can't be specific with this. We have to identify the issue and then come up with all of the issues that will result from identification of that issue that we're not going to solve here tonight. I, I do agree with Brandon Holmes just said, but the basically, I think you're not, we shouldn't be looking at taking people's jobs away, but we should be looking at the bigger picture and trying to allocate their job in another way and train them properly so that they could feel uh, a sense of pride that they are they are doing something that would be a meaningful, but they wouldn't be out of a job. So I think we're really getting into a very social uh, aspect of it. Uh, and I think simpler would be better, but that is a very good point. I think we shouldn't be just categorically saying, you know, just get rid of these people. We have to have a way of transitioning. Well, I, I'm sorry. I don't agree with leaving schools unprotected. I don't have, I don't have uh, school age kids, but I don't know if some of you do. I do not believe in this day and age of leaving schools unprotected. I've seen what happens in school, what happened in schools, what happens in schools, and we've all felt the pain of little, kid, little kids being killed, right? People going into schools and shooting kids. I don't think we should leave schools unprotected. That's my belief. I have grown children, but I still believe we have to protect children in school. There are crazy people out there. You know, I, you know, I, I have six grandchildren. And, I, and they live in the suburbs, and every one of the schools that they go to has a security guard at the desk when you come in. There's no school that I've been to recently here, other states, that does not have someone, a security guard, sitting at the door when people come in. That's the reality of the situation. It's the reality of the situation where they had them in New York, all right? And, and while we all agree that that the, the schools need to be a better place with guidance counselors and everything else. The first thing the schools need to make sure is that the kids are safe. Yeah, but with, yeah. With, you know, it's the nomenclature. There can be a security officer. Doesn't have to be a police officer in a uniform. And I, I agree. If, if the principal feels that he or she needs to have a police officer, then that can be also accommodated. But this is uniform across the system, irrespective of, and that's what we're talking about. No, I agree. I don't think it needs, and and that's why the that's why, although it is somewhat rearranging the deck chairs and like that, had it, removing the security guards from the police department, I think is a good step, a good first step. But it's not. But but they also need they also need the guidance counselors. They also need the the nurses in every school. They also need the, you know the med the uh, the social workers. You know, I'm 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 strongly in favor of, of all of that of reallocating the money. Right? But I also think that the first thing is you have to make sure the schools are safe. Okay, I think we've worded it in a way that is um, sort of um, um, capturing some of these uh, views. So rather than saying remove school safety officers, um, support reduction of school safety officers in public schools decisions to be made in conjunction with principals. Maybe we can say decisions to made on a school by school basis. And uh, retraining them towards guidance, counseling and social work. That's 
Sounds fine. It has flexibility that we need. Okay. Excuse me. Take this off. Um, next training in terms of uh, officers. Um, I, I, I'm not totally up to speed on um, the mental health training the officers currently have in dealing with people um, who are homeless or have um, drug abuse or other issues. Um, do we need to um, increase training in this um, in these uh, fields? Absolutely. Okay. All right, so we'll just say it, leave it at that. Uh, uh, Mr. Holmes, do you have anything to add to this? Uh, I, I would say expanding opportunities for mental health first responders outside of the police. Um, so right now, there's just not many options available. Uh, when you call 911, they dispatch a police officer, not a mental health professional um, or expert. So, some, some language about uh, restricting police officers from being the first responders to a mental health emergency. Um, you know, like some folks have said earlier about the schools issues, you can always call them in a crisis, but if you're not calling for the police, if you're calling for a mental health emergency, then a mental health professional should be the first person on the scene. Great. Great. Um, and on the other side um, is we have had an increase in gun violence over the past two years, particularly in downtown Brooklyn. Um, you know, and, and we have, we have talked about defunding the police at the same time. There are council people, um, that say we want the police in our community and, uh, we don't want to defund the police. We have the NCO officers and, you know, they help keep our community safe. And these are a lot of the, the officers who are of color and in our district. So, you know, this is, it's, it's a balance of what we're talking about in terms of, um, reallocating resources to the alternative programs, but also, you know, keeping our neighborhood safe with the gun violence. So um, I, I open the floor at that. I would just want to say that the word defund becomes a very political statement. And I don't think, I, I think many people wouldn't agree with that statement, but they would like to see something done with the funding that's going to the police, as uh, I think uh, Brandon Holmes mentioned about social work and social services. Uh, using the word defund will put will put it in a political aspect, and you will not gain anything by it. It's my that's just my opinion. I think we all are in favor of that. I, I mean, I certainly am to try to reallocate funds, but using the word defund. Um, I don't think is, uh, I think actually Representative Clyburn, who I admire greatly, uh, came out and said that's not the right word uh, to use. So I would go along with a guy I really respect. But you just said the right word, which is reallocation. Reallocation is a great word. Yeah. We haven't really spoken about it, but what about reallocating away from like military style equipment and helicopters and, and stuff? <laughs> yeah. I, think that, I would think that's a, aside from like taking away people's jobs, that, you know, this would be something that you, that we might want to um, look at, but I know that it's, it, it's kind of tricky the, where that funding comes from. Cause I think some of the funding may come from the federal government and, um, but you know, you know, at some points during this process, there's been like five helicopter police helicopters flying over my house, and I, I don't know why there have to be five. <laughs> Brandon, what are you doing that you're directing so much attention to you? I, I live next <laughs> to the Brooklyn Bridge. People pass by who are protesting, and as a result, they have to have five helicopters to observe them. Mm. That may have been the news, too, though. Um, I mean, I back to Ciro's point. I I I actually have no problem with the word defund and abolish the police. Um, I I just want to you know take us back to 1860 for a minute because ab abolition of slavery wasn't popular. Uh, you know, 
anti-slavery was, you know, the idea that, you know, slavery is inhumane. Yeah, of course, let's, we got to end it at some point. Um, ab abolition, the idea that we need to end it like today, that's, that's where we need to be. And that's what made the difference. So like 20 years from now, when we look back and we say, oh, you know, we reallocated a few million dollars from the NYPD, maybe it made a billion, maybe that's, that's, that's going to be unpopular the same way we look back and we think, wow, slavery that was really messed up. That's not okay. We need to stop enslaving people. Um, like I, I just think that we can think broadly and think actually defunding, actually abolishing police, especially police brutality. And this is a vicious cycle. And just like the militarization of all of it, and how that perpetuates the gun violence on our streets, I think, yeah, sure, get rid of the helicopters, but, you know, also get rid of the police. Well, this is said, I, you know, look, I think we all agree, and if we want to come to a consensus, that the money should be reallocated with a significant portion removed from the police department. I think if you take a vote here, I, I know I would not support the funding of the police department, and I doubt very much that the majority of the committee but that's that's an issue. I think it's an issue of semantics. We basically agree that the amount of money should be removed from the uh, should be reallocated away from the police department. The police department should not be primarily responsible for mental health. Right? Uh, but but I I strongly disagree that that we we should support the funding of the police department. I agree with you, Sid. I think for the consensus of our um, um, funding priorities, I think we I think reallocate would be the word to use. Um, and Carolyn, I I hear you, and a lot of people are saying what you're saying. You know, in the in in, in the world in New York City today. Um, I I would suggest perhaps we put that into. Um, Maybe its own category, you know, maybe it's reallocate. Um, yeah, I, I'm, I, I understand that that perhaps doesn't have a whole lot to do with. Um, you know, district priorities for today, but it didn't sound like anyone was saying it. I wanted to come out and say it. Yeah, Thank yes, you. it was good that it was said. Thank you. Um, so I'm going to kind of lump in um, what some of the funding can be for and really, you know, this is a line item, but then we're going to support, you know, when Yeka comes up with particular opportunities, when our economic development committee comes up with particular opportunities. Um, the health committee, you know, comes up with with mental health opportunities like like this. So, so I'm going to sort of um, say these. Th Funds should be reallocated in generally in support of, you know, these other initiatives. Okay. And I'll wordsmith it. Um, I, can I say so? Do you hear me? Yes. yes. Uh, I just want to say, well, the, the word defund, people are confused about it um, in general, you know, since that word came up and I think it's a negative, you know, defund the police people. A lot of people think get rid of the police. And um, so I guess reallocate would be a more positive word to use. Yeah. And more, really, under really more, more understandable than defund police. Yeah. Julia, could you put it up on the screen? I don't know if we- Sure, let me share my screen again um, once Thank I'm you. allowed to. Thank you. I'll, I'll read it in the meantime. Um, so I have so share content. Share. Okay, so I have this language. Reallocate funding from NYPD. Support youth programs, increasing economic opportunities, education, internships, job training, health and mental health, social services initiatives, and I'll put it together into better English. Oh, that's good. General support of, right. of, of those alternative programs. 
Great. And then, you know, what we discussed about the training of officers, you know, um, expanding the opportunities also for uh, first responders for mental health emergencies, prevention of uh, violent crimes. You know, I don't know how it, it, it necessarily gets addressed, but um, also the, you know, we we add the the root causes. Sandy, you sent something over that the Brooklyn DA is is working on. Um, you know, I don't know. I didn't read it yet, but. There are more details that I think other people can come up with. Absolutely. After packing up the use, it was my next item. The I said something about that. It's not only reallocate for the police department, it's also reallocate from the Department of Corrections as well. Okay. I would like to add that when you say reallocate funding from NYPD, it sounds like you're taking all the funding from NYPD. Maybe right. like to say partial reallocation of funding because if you take away all the funding from NYPD, you have no funding. <laughs> okay, okay. Not in agreement with that. We could say at least a billion. I mean, that billion number seems uh, popular. Um, it's it's definitely it's you know less than a sixth of their budget. So a billion in addition to some of the stuff that has already been happening. That seems conservative and safe. Do you, the, is there a second for that? Or do people want the partial? I don't I don't have a problem with a billion. I got too many cops. <laughs> okay. Anybody have a problem with it? Nope. Can you read it again real fast? Or right. So in the description, reallocate one billion dollars of funding from the NYPD and the Department of Corrections, and then in the um, explanation, support youth programs, increase economic opportunities, support educational education, internships, job training, health and mental health initiative initiatives, and social service initiatives. Yeah, uh, sorry. Can we also add the like changing traffic enforcement so those people don't have guns? Like, I did have. The next item. Oh, right, right. Reduce militarization of police. I mean, you want to have that as a different one? Uh, I don't know that it needs to be a different one, but like if there are going to be these other programs and different kinds of police officers, there could be you know, traffic officers who didn't have yeah, reduced militarization work. Yeah, that's great. Thanks. Okay. Well, I, I don't want to get. You know, the, the two places that police get killed the most are when they go to a domestic dispute or making an ordinary traffic stop. Those are the two greatest causes of police deaths, all right? So, you know, the, the, if you're talking about parking tickets, it's one thing. But if you're talking about moving violation enforcement and stopping cars like that. I'm, I'm talking about uh, writing tickets and, uh, you know, controlling the bike lane. All so right, what does what does reduce militarization actually mean? When you write that down, what does reduce militarization? The actual word. It's a very broad word. I think if we want to do what you're saying, I think we should be more specific to the point that you're making. Saying reduce militarization of police, I I don't know where that's going to go as far as someone's going to say. Oh, what do you mean by that? Uh, what are you saying? So if you talk about the the traffic, I think that's a very good point. But we should be a little more clearer as to what you are specifically requesting. Saying re de reduce militarization, we don't want them wearing uh, all these uh, khakis and, and all these armed AK-847, all that stuff they wear. We'd like to get rid of that. We all want to do that. Yeah, but that, that certain, seems to, to fall extent, into that. You know, that they also exist around potential terrorist hotspots and, yeah. and you know, some of us were around. You were probably there during September 11th. You know, I think you should just take out that statement right out. Reduce militarization. Just take it out. Should we just say, uh, take it traffic out. officers, traffic agents should not carry guns? You could say that if you want to traffic say that. Traffic officers don't carry guns. Oh. Well, some do. Carol, well, some um, do. Actually, some traffic enforcement, some of the people, there are a small group of traffic that do in fact carry guns. Those are the ones on the highways. No, not the ones on no, the highways. Right, I'm, I'm going to take it out. Because it's contentious. I'm going to take it out. 
All right, I'm going to go to a non contentious one. Placard parking abuse. <laughs> yeah, <that's enough. laughs> Where's the wine? <laughs> right, exactly. It's about time for wine, right? Who's, who's going to pour the wine? <laughs> yeah, you know, this is Sid brought to my attention that DOT used to be the agency responsible for enforcing placard parking abuse and for writing tickets and summonses to um, people. You know, obviously the police are not going to police themselves. De Blasio established a separate unit within the NYPD. They, I think they issued 100 tickets all year. Well, they, they actually issued more in Manhattan. They, 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 they have what's called self-enforcement zone. Okay? But it used to be the tra and they, and what happened with the traffic enforcement people used to get into fights with the police department. As you know, the police department's armed. I mean, so. Uh, <laughs> uh, and Sid, I think you also told me about like a um, new technology that they're working on where um, once they scan the placard or the license plate, it is automatic. Um, the, the, the ticket gets generated automatically. And yeah, that's no, what they're working on right now. They'll be working on that. That, they, that is on the, that is on the uh, agenda for the and, and under DOT. But it's probably not going to be for another year or two. Okay, so let's support it then, since it's, you know, it's not yet funded. Um, so I'll read the whole thing. Reform traffic enforcement and parking violations to reduce placard parking abuse, such as by expanding the use of technology to scan placards and license plates and automatically issue tickets. Um, I can also say, um, also, I um, also consider empowering a different agency, such as DOT, which was per previously responsible for this function for traffic enforcement to reduce conflicts of interest. <laughs> and then we have um, transitional and supportive housing. Um, thanks. But are you guys bearing in mind that all the placards out there are not only for police men? You, That's right. It's, it's That's right. Problem. You have the courts, you have the prisons, right. you have everybody. So I mean, you have the point is on this. This is only cops that that car incorrectly. No, it's not. No, yeah, I'm not blaming cops for placard abuse. I, I think it's rampant amongst everyone. There are people who work at Trader Joe's who do placard abuse. But I but they are policing it. Yes, and they're not they're allowing the legal permits out there to issued by a whole bunch of different people. That yeah. are Juliet, if if there is this new uh, technology, this scanning. Uh, I don't know if we should say it, but basically, uh, those who are constantly uh, uh, abusing it right. and they, their license comes up quite a few times, there should be much more of a penalty for that. Maybe, you know, if, if you get somebody who does it all the time, you just get the ticket paid. That means nothing to him or her. Re repeat okay. offenders should face higher penalties. <laughs> Sounds good. But if that, but yeah, repeat that's offenders, not... right. And or revocation of privileges. Yeah. I mean, the license <laughs> is the owner of the car, not the driver who's put up the placard. Usually it's the same person, but it's not no, you know, that just invites a, a you know, to switch cars. So well, I would, I would, I would err on the side of the going after the abuser and then, then work it out later. Yeah. Can I, can I? In fact, for a second, yes. Um, what whatever it is, whatever the concept is, it must always be able to be tied in with a budget. So I'm not sure how this ties in. This when is a DOT item. Since said that DOT was already considering um, creating a um, an, a technology to automatically um, create these tickets. So yeah, put DOT on here at yeah. the agency. I think it's DOT and uh, NYPD because potentially, potentially, if this becomes a different agency, it is a reallocation of NYPD funds to DOT. I, I, but I, we might be stretching a little bit when we get into policy part on a budget priority. Consider, um. Increasing fines for others. I don't know. Um, 
usually it's about us asking for money to to come in mm, okay so we'll have to word this so fund we'll have to word it from a fund perspective all right yeah fund alternative traffic enforcement of park of traffic enforcement of Fun alternative enforcement of, of placard parking abuse. How about that? Okay. Um, and then coronavirus. Is, is there anything that overlaps um, the public space and uh, you know public safety or potentially you know the criminal justice system and coronavirus? I feel like you know it's already happening somewhat, but um, do we want to say? Um, Put something on our um, budget priorities. Um, yeah, I think we should. What I what I have um, is you know tying it to the open streets programs, um, but expanding that open streets programs, which was just you know expedited sidewalk cafe permits, um, but expanding that to schools and other businesses so that you know kids can learn outside and. Um, you know, we could we could employ the public space in a better way. Um, we you know, retailers maybe can set up a little, um, you know, outside stand or something to sell some other goods outside. No, no seconds on that. Should I take it out? All right. If there's no seconds, I'm gonna take it out. All right. Oh, sorry, ma'am. No, whatever. Okay. All right, that is it for our um, additions. <laughs> Quickly, let's go through the um, existing requests. So we'll start with the capital one um, that basically NYPD said we can't fund anyway, which is <laughs> renovating and expanding the ADA. So I would recommend that we remove this request. Is there any disagreement to that? If we can't fund it, so. Exactly. Um, request. Okay, the next one is assign additional traffic enforcement officers. Um, this, um, to me, I, I was one of the ones that had supported this and it came to light afterwards that the traffic enforcement officers are actually trying to move cars very quickly and not trying to keep pedestrians safe. So right. um, that was not something I was really aware of. Um, and so I would support removing that item actually, but totally open to you know what you guys would like to say. I mean, this connects into the, pro the possible additions to discuss because like the, I think the traffic and placard people were thinking about who aren't necessarily police are the ones who would care about <laughs> pedestrian and bike safety. No, they don't. So those are different. They're not traffic enforcement officers. So um, they're crossing guards and they only put them by schools. So, and I think that there's not really a dearth of crossing guards. They're, they're pretty, they're fairly well placed. I feel like. Yep. So. Is it okay? Anybody object to removing this one? Well, actually, no. does any? I, I I don't know the answer to this, but with school being kind of murky, uh, at least for the fall, do, will the crossing guards stay around even mm -hmm. without schools? I don't know. Um, you know, the idea is that public schools. De Blasio is still saying public schools are opening just at reduced capacity and at the hybrid model where people are supposed to actually show up two days a week if you know if they're comfortable doing that my roommate is a teacher and doesn't a public school teacher and i don't he's not convinced he's going right yeah <laughs> but at some point i feel like it's it, whether That's it's in a month conversation or, I, yeah, i'm curious yeah. about crossing guards either way um, but I guess that doesn't have anything to do with this. I'm fine if yeah. you want to remove that. Okay, thank you. Um, assign additional uniformed officers 
in the ADA and the 84th. And then the response is that NYPD has implemented the NCO program to address community concerns, which they certainly have. And I feel like they've done a good job with that. Commands under the NCO program have had a sizable increase in staffing compared to um, prior years. And so given that we're asking to reduce NYPD funding, I think yeah. we need this request too. <laughs> Interesting. You're right, Julia. Yeah. Okay. Um, next one, expand funding for fire prevention and life safety. I better see this document. <laughs> Um, I think we keep this one. This is a John, John Doe. This is yours. Uh, hire additional FDNY inspectors to inspect new high rise construction. That's um, good. Yeah. And as I said, I don't understand why they don't just train the firemen and the, the number of fire calls to the fire department is down tremendously. And what they've done with the fire department to increase the usage of them is now when they get a heart attack call, besides sending the, uh, sending an ambulance, they oh. send a fire truck. So I don't understand what the, what the number of, of, of fires being down so significantly, why they aren't retraining some of the firemen to, to do the, do the inspection. And, and frankly, as you know, I mean, it's an important because when there is a fire, it's a fire department that has to come and call the staff. So I don't understand why they just don't retrain the fire department people to do the inspection. Yep. Okay. Um, so that is it with regards to um, public safety and emergency services. So um, we still have transportation on the list, but um, I would like to say thank you to Brandon Holmes and Brandon, Brandon Smith for all their time and their very thoughtful comments in this conversation. So thank, thanks to both of you, and we want to stay for the uh, transportation part of the call. Um, are they are they even on anymore? I think Brandon Holmes left. Okay, perfect. And Brandon Smith. Perfect. Okay. Um, capital request re related to transportation. Are you guys still seeing my screen or no? Yes. yes. Okay, great. So, install streetscape improvements, um, extend Flatbush Avenue streetscape improvements from DeKalb to Atlantic, and it is in is funded. It's included in the 10 year plan. That, that's what that means, right? Carol Ann, it means it's funded already, right? No. Oh, okay. It's not funded. No, we have, to, we have to leave it on the list then. Yes. <laughs> okay. All right. Then we have upgrade or create new plazas. And this one particularly is times plaza. We have to keep that on the list. Install streetscape improvements. The Atlantic Avenue gateway beneath the BQE at the foot of Atlantic Avenue. Do we want to say anything about including this in the reconstruction of the BQE and making sure? Yeah, yeah. I, I think it seems to be coordinated with the, that, basically, it seems to be. Um, Juliet, can you hear me? Yes, Sandy. So that was something uh, that our bid was working on uh, years ago. And uh, I think it should be in, incorporated in the BQE project because they're, the Atlantic Avenue, is it called interchange? Now I'm having a senior moment, but that whole underneath yep. the Atlantic, yeah, Berman, right. um, that's going to be redesigned. And there's discussion about even closing the, um, the ramps Oh. And moving them a little bit, so um, you know our our project was sort of lighting, and we did two murals, and we wanted to do plantings. But there's going to be a whole a whole okay a redesign you, redesign of that area by DOT. I think you can remove it. You can remove it. You think? Yeah, because it's part of that whole that whole setup. 
cantilever. So, Carol Ann, do you think we can remove it? Whatever the committee decides, yes. It will still I don't be. think so. I think I think it's a more tangible local thing about the project. Uh, and actually, there are lots of park spaces that can benefit from the BQA. Um, about, you know, yeah, all the way up to Sand in, Street. In, incorporate. Maybe we change it a little bit. Incorporate um, public art and um, uh, park and green space in the uh, redesign of the BQA entrances and exits. Something like that. But, but I would say that Atlantic Avenue Gateway is, is a prime example of that. Okay, so instead of develop fully the Atlantic Avenue Gateway to be the BQE, I'll say that and then incorporating um, public public art, um, park, green space. Green space. Yeah. Okay, and then in coordination with the construction of the BQA. All right, great. Next one is um, improved traffic and pedestrian safety, including traffic calming, and that's school zone speed cameras. And it says the agency will accommodate this issue within existing resources. Does that mean, Caroline, that it's funded or not yet? Um, it means they'll make an attempt to pay to, to fund it with within their current existing. Okay, so I think we should just leave that on there then. Anybody object? Okay, great. And then we have the triple cantilever, which was formerly the, the priority item. And now we have to think about whether we want a new priority item. I'm not sure we should take that off as a priority item. I mean, I know well, I respect it off the list, but it was, I it was one of the number one, pro like, like there's a first page, it's top three pressing issues overall in Brooklyn Community Board 2. It went up to the first page. Well, it actually still is a priority for everyone in the community. And, and to now yeah. reduce it does make a statement. I think it should be forward, first and forward, in front of everyone because it's still a major issue that has not really been resolved and with the budgetary issues that we have coming up this may go on i may have my tombstone somewhere near it somewhere before it's built so i would be very much in favor of keeping it as a top priority because it it is such a fractious issue for the whole from from sunset park right on through to um right along the northern part of, of Brooklyn. So I, I would keep it as, as a priority. It's, that's my choice. Okay. It's not on here, but I mean, I, I rode my bicycle on the Manhattan Bridge uh, yesterday, and I, I don't know if there's room for, uh, you know, bicycle improvements on the Brooklyn Manhattan Bridge. Uh, I do think that, like, to me, just in terms of what's feasible and doable and doesn't cost multiple billions of dollars, um, it, I think that would be a higher priority, especially with more people biking. And, you know, we're trying not to have more people biking. Um, so this cap, this is capital re related to transportation. So um, any physical barrier to create a bike lane? Sure. As a physical barrier to create a bike lane in the roadbed of the Manhattan Bridge. Thank you. And then I'll say lanes. Bike lane or lanes. Yeah, and then if you want to copy that and say Brooklyn Bridge, that sounds great. Yeah. I'm going to say both. I'm just going to put it in one because, you know, people are voting. Okay. Uh, any other additional? Yes. I was just going to suggest if we wanted to make it um, at a protected bike lane. 
Thank you, Chairman. And that's DOT. Okay, I'm gonna send this, I'm gonna clean it up a little bit, Carolyn, but then you can work your magic on it too and make it, you know, more appropriate. Are there any other capital requests with, um, for transportation that people suggest? I don't know if this is a capital request, but uh, the mayor uh, along the uh, BQE, the mayor had uh, initiated um, uh, a lower speed for trucks that that are on the BQE between right. sand and and what I had wondered is would they be able to put some sort of a uh, electronic um, uh, a, you know, test to find out who is speeding. I know they did something with the weight. They have a weight reduction, but I don't think uh, there's a way of enforcing, which we have, you know, of the speeding that goes on along that highway, which really, in, it sort of, sort of, it continues to deteriorate the bed rock of the highway. So I was wondering if there was a speed, uh, one of those uh, cameras or something that would detect people speeding. I'm not sure we could put that in, but that was some of the things that my neighbors have told me about. So we do, uh, so Rob, I've been advocating for cameras for a long time too, and Rob Paris um, informed me that there are only a couple cameras in New York City that are speed cameras that are not school zone speed cameras, and that um, there's no way we're going to get a camera unless it's in a school zone. Basically, I, I would have to do, in all due respect to Rob, I would just say that's interesting, that's past history, and all I would say is as a community board, oh, we can take it up anyway. From a legislative perspective, Ciro, it's from a legislative perspective, it's not from a policy perspective. And it's the state, the state law. Right. Right. Uh, speed cameras are with the state. They are what? I didn't hear you. The authority for, for locating speed cameras is allocated by the state. I see. And it's not permitted on highways. It's state law right now. Right. So. Well, I have a fight on my hands. Yeah. So I support this <laughs> idea. It's, you know, but it's not legislatively permissible. I understand. DOT can do is they can put a radar with a with what the speed is. Yeah, they can have a speed board. Okay, maybe I misspoke. That, that, that would be fine. That would be fine. We could do that. Okay. Where on the BQE are you finding people are speeding it's particularly? On the, uh, um, I would say from the from the. Um, Whatever exit up to Cadman Plaza exit that that area the the, the um, overpass that goes up up to the Brooklyn Bridge. I don't know the location. Yeah, that's it. Patrick, you're correct. Twenty-eight A. Is that an exit or an entrance? Uh, I think it's an exit only, actually. Right. Yeah. Okay. Northbound or uh, east, eastbound, it's exit only. It's near, it, it's uh, uh, and the, traffic flows anyway. the Columbia Street Bridge area. That's that's where. And eastbound traffic? Yes. Towards the end of the mile. Yes. Okay. Thank you. I'm going to move to expense requests relating to transportation. So I have conduct traffic or parking studies, study the creation of commuter van terminals in downtown Brooklyn. And um, the response is it's discuss the borough commissioner's office. So um, what does that mean? Can you hear me? Go ahead, yes. Yeah, um, they, you know, the commuter vans have been, um, a problem in downtown and yeah that's what this says it says no no but, yeah. but but there were designated stops there were and yeah they, and they never used them uh they all even <laughs> even the legal um commuter vans because some are legal and some aren't they all use the bus stops 
which which they're not supposed to do but that's where the customers are so there are stops that they don't use so i don't know what they're studying here a, a, a van terminal what does that mean terminal is it still a problem do you guys think it's still a problem in downtown brooklyn the community oh, yes it's a big problem okay i mean they shouldn't even come go to southwest atlantic it's a really big problem so should there be more um drop-off zones um or a terminal i think the drop i think drop off is relatively simple they get there they drop off and go i think it's when they're picking people for people picking people up that they tend to uh, uh bunch up stay there for a while that's what the problem is all right so instead of um advocating for a terminal why don't we say um re stud study or let's say review and increase commuter van pickup and drop-off locations no no juliet because they can't they they won't enforce it they they could i guess just like they could do the permit parkers but they won't enforce this they they do once in a blue moon and in my opinion they they should be not bringing those vans to where it's so congested because uh it's really a convenience not a necessity um people could you know the the vans shouldn't come into the downtown and they, and they can't enforce it, and they won't park <laughs> Well, we'll send them to Coney Island, to Sandy. <laughs> no, you know what? I used to take. Am I still on? Am yeah, I still on? I used to take the. I used to teach out in Queens, and we had to use the um, these these dollar vans, and I took the train from from uh, the A train from here and got off at Rockaway Boulevard and then took the bus, I mean the uh, van, because the buses would never wait for us or they didn't show up. Um, so, you know, I did it and I took two, you know, the subway and the van. What are you, you know, saying? I'm not saying, saying something that I never did. What are you saying in terms of this request? Juliet, why don't you leave it as it is? Maybe there is a possibility there is a piece of land somewhere that they can have a terminal that they can all go to, you know. So you're you're looking at the creation of the terminal and also you're reviewing the pickup and drop off locations. As it is, it's it's nice and broad. But... Okay. I know Cindy, it would it's not totally supportive of that, but I feel like it's it's been like that for a couple of years. Yeah, I I think the creation of this terminal is a great thing to say. Okay. All right, I'm moving to the next one, which is upgrade or create new plazas. And I'll say work with downtown Brooklyn partnership, and then I'll say who has developed a. Not really exactly a master plan, but I'll look up what it's called and I'll call it for now a master plan. Um, to identify locations for um, new plazas, open space, um, I'll say pedestrian, pedestrian open space, and green space. And traffic calming. Oh, yes. Yeah. Okay, traffic calming, calming, and pedestrian open space and green space. Okay. Great. All right, and then conduct traffic uh, parking studies is the next one, and um, that is general. And it's names Tillery and Flatbush, Skirmahan and Flatbush, particularly. Are there other locations that we should name? Um, maybe uh, the Thomas Plaza that's area. That's fine. It's okay. a it's a black it's a black you know what and and some landing in Flatbush because people are getting either getting off or being dropped off there to go to the uh, uh, 
uh, to go to the Long Island Railroad. You know, that, they, they, these vans come there because that's where the people are. They just recently studied that too, and they came to us. I don't remember if we talked about the vans during that discussion. I talked about the buses, but, you know, they're talking about the buses. I'm not exactly sure what they're going to do with the buses. Okay. I have to bring them. But, but people are going to, you know, people opt for the convenience. And just like the uh, placard of this, that right. until the city starts enforcing it, right, that's an issue. You know, okay. Uh, why don't I add enforcement on this? Increase enforcement. Yeah, they're not going to do it. Yeah, they're not going to do it. No. Increase enforcement of illegally um, illegal drop offs. Every one of them are illegal because they're in the bus stops. Not everyone. Uh, yeah, I know there are some that whatever. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, and then the possible addition to discuss, I added because Latrell had brought she came to one of our um, meetings. Our um um she was on this call. I'm not sure if she still waited out this long, but you know she had mentioned a an incident where she got on the bus and they're supposed to do announcements for the stops, it's supposed to be automatic. The bus operator did not announce the stops, turned off the feature. Um, so she, you know, like it was, it, it's difficult for somebody with a visual impairment um, and perhaps the bus operators could use additional training um, on that. So I put that in as a uh, expense re request. Increased accessibility features for visual and mobility impairment and training for MTA bus op operators. And anything else to add? All right. If there's nothing else to add. I'm going to save this and then. Close it up. Um, you know, the stats I was just going to pull up. And uh, I don't know, is, is this a chair's report now? No, not yet. Does uh, it feel right. Excuse me, Julia? Yes. Excuse me. I don't believe we voted on the uh, presentation. Were Let's we vote on the presentation. Thank you, Caroline. <laughs> Thank you. Do we have a motion on the um, 11 Hoyt presentation? So moved. So Sid motions to support. Second. I'll Juliet start. seconds, if nobody else does. Oh, I did. Oh, John Quinn seconds. Thank you. Um, do we have to do a roll call vote, Caroline? Uh, oh, let's do all. Be easier. all let's do, if any, does anybody object or abstain, first of all? Uh, to what? The approval um, of the, the 11 point presentation. Uh, Regina Meyer, the early in the meeting presentation. No. The Toy Street presentation. So we'll do all in favor? Aye. 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 Objections? Abstentions? Okay, it's unanimous. Patrick, were you here for the, when, I didn't notice when you came in, did you hear the presentation? I did not, but I, I, I like the idea of it. Great. <laughs> Great. Be <laughs> Thank you for making it unanimous, Patrick. <laughs> You're okay. observant. All right. And um, the next item in the agenda is the minutes. Is there any objections to the minutes? I abstain. I wasn't there. Okay. Um, can I have a motion to approve the minutes? So moved. Sandy, second? Second. Zero. Um, all in favor? Aye. Aye. I'm going to assume that's everybody. Abstentions or objections? No. Okay, great. Um, chair's report, very briefly. Thank you, everybody, for um, bearing with us for the very long discussion today. 
Um, I'm glad we were able to tackle public safety in a in a uh, much more in depth way. And I, I just want to let you know, I heard from you guys and um, really wanted to make that a priority today and more so in future committee meetings. So um, I know that we have been focused a lot on transportation and I'm, I'm going to try to balance it out um, to the extent that I can. Julia, can you move the uh, cursor up? I can't see the top of the chart. Sure. All right, um, I'm sharing. Can you guys see the CompStat report for the 84th precinct? A little further down. That's perfect. That's good. Okay. Okay, so this is the report covering um, the last week that Rob gave to me. Um, so the 28 day would be um, prior to August 9th. Um, it does show a lot of decreases. Um, however, the year to date, we're still high on the shootings. So we're still up 300% and 200% on the shootings. Um, it is it is heartening that some of the other stuff is is their negatives. And then just very briefly on the 88th, it's <clears throat> similar with um, a lot a lot more shootings this year than um, than last year already. Of three murders this year when they had none last year. Yeah. So, um, I am not, I don't have a further chair's report. Um, Julia, can I just say that I'm very pleased to be back? And I think this is one of the best committees. I, I've been around a few other committees also, but I think what we're concentrating on as far as uh, looking at security and things like that, it really shows how much interest we are giving to a very important subject. I'm happy to be back again. Thank you. Welcome back, Zero. We're happy to have you back too. Thank you. Um, does anybody have any other business to bring forth before the committee? And I don't think there's anybody that has left, that has stayed on from the community to have community forum. So with that, I would, um, like to adjourn. Welcome, adjourn the meeting. Well, I have have a great summer, everybody. If I don't see you and see some of you guys in the upcoming meetings. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. 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 Be well, everyone. You too.